When my mother was pregnant with me, she told me later, a party of hooded Ku Klux Klan riders galloped up to our home in Omaha, Nebraska one night. Surrounding the house, brandishing their shotguns and rifles, they shouted for my father to come out. My mother went to the front door and opened it, standing where they could see her pregnant condition. She told them that she was alone with three small children and that my father was away preaching in Milwaukee. The Klansmen shouted threats and warnings at her that we had better get out of town because the good Christian white people were not going to stand for my father spreading trouble among the good Negroes of Omaha with the back-to-Africa preachings of Marcus Garvey. My father, the Reverend Earl Little, was a Baptist minister, a dedicated organizer for Marcus Aurelius Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. With the help of such disciples as my father, Garvey, from his headquarters in New York City's Harlem, was raising the banner of black race purity and exhorting the Negro masses to return to their ancestral African homeland, a cause which had made Garvey the most controversial black man on earth. Still shouting threats, the Klansmen finally spurred their horses and galloped around the house, shattering every window pane with their gun butts. Then they rode off into the night, their torches flaring, as suddenly as they had come. My father was enraged when he returned. He decided to wait until I was born, which would be soon, and then the family would move. I'm not sure why I made this decision, for he was not a frightened Negro, as most then were, and many still are today. My father was a, a big six-foot-four, very black man. He had only one eye. How he'd lost the other one, I have never known. He was from Reynolds, Georgia, where he had left school after the third or maybe fourth grade. He believed, as did Marcus Garvey, that freedom, independence, and self-respect could never be achieved by the Negro in America, and that therefore the Negro should leave America to the white man and return to his African land of origin. Among the reasons my father had decided to risk and dedicate his life to help disseminate this philosophy among his people was that he had seen four of his six brothers die by violence, three of them killed by white men, including one by lynching. What my father could not know then was that of the remaining three, including himself, only one, my Uncle Jim, would die in bed of natural causes. Northern white police were later to shoot my Uncle Oscar, and my father was himself to die by the white man's hands. It has always been my belief that I, too, will die by violence. I have done all that I can to be prepared. I was my father's seventh child. He had three children by a previous marriage, Ella, Earl, and Mary, who lived in Boston. He had met and married my mother in Philadelphia, where their first child, my oldest full brother, Wilfred, was born. They moved from Philadelphia to Omaha, where Hilda and then Philbert were born. I was next in line. My mother was 28 when I was born on May 19, 1925, in an Omaha hospital. Then we moved to Milwaukee, where Reginald was born. From infancy, he had some kind of hernia condition which was to handicap him physically for the rest of his life. Louise Little, my mother, who was born in Grenada in the British West Indies, looked like a white woman. Her father was white. She had straight black hair, and her accent did not sound like a Negro's. Of this white father of hers, I know nothing except her shame about it. I remember hearing her say she was glad that she had never seen him. It was, of course, because of him that I got my reddish-brown, marinic color of skin and my hair of the same color. I was the lightest child in our family. Out in the world later on, in Boston and New York, I was among the millions of Negroes who were insane enough to feel that it was some kind of status symbol to be light-complexioned, that one was actually fortunate to be born thus. But still later, I learned to hate every drop of that white rapist's blood that is in me. Our family stayed only briefly in Milwaukee, for my father wanted to find a place where he could raise our own food and perhaps build a business. The teaching of Marcus Garvey stressed becoming independent of the white man. We went next, for some reason, to Lansing, Michigan, 
My father bought a house and soon, as had been his pattern, he was doing freelance Christian preaching in the local Negro Baptist churches, and during the week he was roaming about spreading the word of Marcus Garvey. This time, the get-out-of-town threats came from a local hate society called the Black Legion. They wore black robes instead of white. Soon, nearly everywhere my father went, Black Legionnaires were reviling him as an uppity nigger for wanting to own a store, for living outside the Lansing Negro District, for spreading unrest and dissension among the good niggers. As in Omaha, my mother was pregnant again, this time with my youngest sister. Shortly after Yvonne was born came the Nightman Night in 1929, my earliest vivid memory. I remember being suddenly snatched awake into a frightening confusion of pistol shots and shouting and smoke and flames. My father had shouted and shot at the two white men who had set the fire and were running away. Our home was burning down around us. We were lunging and bumping and tumbling all over each other trying to escape. My mother, with the baby in her arms, just made it into the yard before the house crashed in, showering sparks. I remember we were outside in the night in our underwear, crying and yelling our heads off. The white police and firemen came and stood around watching as the house burned down to the ground. My father prevailed on some of his friends to clothe and house us temporarily. Then he moved us into another house on the outskirts of East Lansing. In those days, Negroes weren't allowed after dark in East Lansing proper. There's where Michigan State University is located. I related all this to an audience of students when I spoke there in January 1963. I told them how East Lansing harassed us so much that we had to move again, this time two miles out of town into the country. This is where my father built for us with his own hands a four-room house. This is where I really began to remember things, this home where I started to grow up. After the fire, I remember that my father was called in and questioned about a permit for the pistol with which he had shot at the white man who set the fire. I remember the police were always dropping by our house, shoving things around, just checking or looking for a gun. The pistol they were looking for, which they never found, and for which they wouldn't issue a permit, was sewed up inside a pillow. My father's twenty-two rifle and his shotgun, though, were right out in the open. Everyone had them for hunting birds and rabbits and other game. After that, my memories are... Uh, of the friction between my father and mother. They seem to be nearly always at odds. Sometimes my father would beat her. It might have had something to do with the fact that my mother had a pretty good education. Where she got it, I don't know, but an educated woman, I suppose, can't resist the temptation to correct an uneducated man. Every now and then, when she would put those smooth words on him, he would grab her. My father was also belligerent toward all of the children, except me. The older ones he would beat almost savagely if they broke any of his rules, and he had so many rules it was hard to know them all. Nearly all my whippings came from my mother. I actually believe that as anti-white as my father was, he was subconsciously so afflicted with the white man's brainwashing of Negroes that he inclined to favor the light ones, and I was his lightest child. Back when I was growing up, the successful Lansing Negroes were such as waiters and boot blacks. To be a janitor at some downtown store was to be highly respected. The real elite, the big shots, the voices of the race were the waiters at the Lansing Country Club and the shoeshine boys at the state capitol. The only Negroes who had any money were the ones in the numbers racket or who ran gambling houses or who in some other way lived parasitically off the poorest ones who were the masses. No Negroes were hired then by Lansing's big Oldsmobile plant or the Rio plant. The bulk of the Negroes were either on welfare or WPA, or they starved. The day was to come when our family was so poor that we would eat the whole out of a donut. But at that time, we were much better off than most town Negroes. The reason was, we raised much of our own food out there in the country where we were. We were much better off than the town Negroes who would shout as my father preached for the pie in the sky and the heaven and the hereafter while the white man had his here on earth. 
I knew that the collections my father got from his preaching were mainly what fed and clothed us. And he also did other odd jobs, but still, the image of him that made me proudest was his crusading and militant campaigning with the word of Marcus Garvey. As young as I was then, I knew from what I overheard that my father was saying something that made him a tough man. I remember an old lady grinning and saying to my father, You're scaring these white folks to death. One of the reasons I've always felt that my father favored me was that to the best of my remembrance, it was only me that he sometimes took with him to the Garvey UNIA meetings, which he held quietly in different people's homes. There never were more than a few people at any one time, twenty at most, but that was a lot packed into someone's living room. I noticed how differently they all acted, although sometimes they were the same people who jumped and shouted in church. But in these meetings, both they and my father were more intense, more intelligent and down-to-earth. It made me feel the same way. I can remember hearing of Adam driven out of the garden into the caves of Europe, Africa for the Africans, Ethiopians awake, and my father would talk about how it would not be much longer before Africa would be completely run by Negroes, by black men was the phrase he always used. No one knows when the hour of Africa's redemption cometh. It is in the wind. It is coming one day like a storm. It will be here. I have never understood why, after hearing as much as I did of these kinds of things, I somehow never thought then of the black people in Africa. My image of Africa at the time was of naked savages, cannibals, monkeys, and tigers, and steaming jungles. My mother at this time seemed to be always working, cooking, washing, ironing, cleaning, and fussing over us eight children. And she was usually either arguing with or not speaking to my father. One cause of friction was that she had strong ideas about what she wouldn't eat and didn't want us to eat, including pork and rabbit, both of which my father loved dearly. He was a real Georgia Negro, and he believed in eating plenty of what we in Harlem today call soul food. I've said that my mother was the one who whipped me. <laughs> At least she did whenever she wasn't ashamed to let the neighbors think that she was killing me. For if she even acted as though she was about to raise her hand to me, I would open my mouth and let the world know about it. If anybody was passing by out on the road, she would either change her mind or just give me a few licks. Thinking about it now, I feel definitely that just as my father favored me for being lighter than the other children, my mother gave me more hell for the same reason. She was very light herself, but she favored the ones who were darker. Wilfred, I know, was particularly her angel. I remember that she would tell me to get out of the house and let the sun shine on you so you can get some color. She went out of her way never to let me become afflicted with a sense of color superiority. I am sure that she treated me this way partly because of how she came to be light herself. I learned early that crying out in protest could accomplish things. My older brothers and sister had started to school when sometimes they would come in and ask for a buttered biscuit or something, and my mother, impatiently, would tell them no. But I would cry out and make a fuss until I got what I wanted. <laughs> I remember well how my mother asked me why I couldn't be a nice boy like Wilfred, but I would think to myself that Wilfred, for being so nice and quiet, often stayed hungry. So early in life, I had learned that if you want something, you better make some noise. Not only did we have our big garden, but we raised chickens. My father would buy some baby chicks, and my mother would raise them. We all loved chicken. That was one dish there was no argument with my father about. One thing in particular that I remember made me feel grateful toward my mother was that one day I went and asked her for my own garden. And she did let me have my own little plot. I loved it and took care of it well. I loved especially to grow peas. I was proud when we had them on our table. I would pull out the grass in my garden by hand when the first little blades came up. 
I would patrol the rows on my hands and knees for any worms and bugs, and I would kill and bury them. And sometimes when I had everything straight and clean for my things to grow, I would lie down on my back between two rows. I would gaze up in the blue sky at the clouds moving and think of all kinds of things. At five, I too began to go to school, leaving home in the morning along with Wilfred, Hilda, and Philbert. It was the Pleasant Grove School that went from kindergarten through the eighth grade. It was two miles outside the city limits, and I guess there was no problem about our attending because we were the only Negroes in the area. In those days, white people in the North usually would adopt just a few Negroes. They didn't see them as any threat. The white kids didn't make any great thing about us either. They called us nigger and darky and rasty so much that we thought those were our natural names. But they didn't think of it as an insult. It was just the way they thought about us. One afternoon in 1931, when Wilfred, Hilda, Philbert, and I came home, my mother and father were having one of their arguments. There had lately been a lot of tension around the house because of Black Legion threats. Anyway, my father had taken one of the rabbits which we were raising and ordered my mother to cook it. We raised rabbits but sold them to whites. My father had taken a rabbit from the rabbit pen. He had pulled off the rabbit's head. He was so strong, he needed no knife to behead chicken or rabbits. With one twist of his big black hands, he simply twisted off the head and threw the bleeding neck thing back at my mother's feet. My mother was crying. She started to skin the rabbit preparatory to cooking it. But my father was so angry, he slammed on out of the front door and started walking up the road toward town. It was then that my mother had this vision. She had always been a strange woman in this sense and had always had a strong intuition of things about to happen. And most of her children are the same way, I think. When something is about to happen, I can feel something, sense something. I never have known something to happen that has caught me completely off guard, except once. And that was when years later I discovered facts I couldn't believe about a man who up until that discovery I would gladly have given my life for. My father was well up the road when my mother ran screaming out onto the porch. Early, early, she screamed his name. She clutched her apron up in one hand and ran down across the yard and into the road. My father turned around. He saw her. For some reason, considering how angry he had been when he left, he waved at her. But he kept on going. She told me later, my mother did, that she had a vision of my father's end. All of the rest of the afternoon she was not herself, crying and nervous and upset. She finished cooking the rabbit and put the whole thing in the warmer part of the black stove. When my father was not back home by our bedtime, my mother hugged and clutched us, and we felt strange, not knowing what to do because she had never acted like that. I remember waking up to the sound of my mother screaming again. When I scrambled out, I saw the police in the living room. They were trying to calm her down. She had snatched on her clothes to go with them, and all of us children who were staring knew without anyone having to say it that something terrible had happened to our father. My mother was taken by the police to the hospital into a room where a sheet was over my father in a bed, and she wouldn't look. She was afraid to look. Probably it was wise that she didn't. My father's skull on one side was crushed in, I was told later. Negroes and Lanson have always whispered that he was attacked and then laid across some tracks for a streetcar to run him over. His body was cut almost in half. He lived two and a half hours in that condition. Negroes then were stronger than they are now, especially Georgia Negroes. Negroes born in Georgia had to be strong simply to survive. It was morning when we children at home got the word that he was dead. I was six. I can remember a vague commotion, the house filled up with people crying, saying bitterly that the white black legion had finally got him. My mother was hysterical. In the bedroom, women were holding smelling salts under her nose. She was still hysterical at the funeral. I don't have a very clear memory of the funeral either. Oddly, the main thing I remember about it was that it wasn't in a church, and that surprised me. Since my father was a preacher, and I had been there when he preached people's funerals in churches. But his was in a funeral home. And I remember 
that during the service a big black fly came down and landed on my father's face, and Wilford sprang up from his chair and he shooed the fly away and he came groping back to his chair. There were folding chairs for us to sit on, and the tears were streaming down his face. When we went by the casket, I remember that I thought it looked as if my father's strong black face had been dusted with flour, and I wished they hadn't put on such a lot of it. The family that Earl Little left behind faced many hardships. When a life insurance policy he had carried refused to pay, claiming the death was a suicide, the family sank quickly into debt and then onto welfare. Louise Little worked whatever jobs she could find, mostly housework and sewing for white families, and Wilfred, the oldest child, quit school and went to work. But there was never enough money, and by 1934, at the height of the Depression, the family was desperate. Growing fast, always hungry, Malcolm would sometimes steal food from stores in Lansing. He also began visiting friends and neighbors around dinner time, particularly a family named Gohannus, who were raising a nephew called Big Boy of Malcolm's age. When Malcolm was caught stealing, he became the focus of efforts by state agencies to place Louise Little's children in foster homes. Malcolm's mother made no secret of the hatred she felt for the welfare workers. She deeply resented their frequent visits and became incensed when she discovered that they had already made initial arrangements for Malcolm to live with the Gohanas. The welfare workers began to suggest to the children that their mother might be losing her mind. It was about this time that a large, dark man from Lansing began visiting. I don't remember how or where he and my mother met. It may have been through some mutual friends. I don't remember what his profession was. In 1935 in Lansing, Negroes didn't have anything you could call a profession. But the man, big and black, looked something like my father. I can remember his name, but there's no need to mention it. He was a single man, and my mother was a widow only 36 years old. The man was independent. Naturally, she admired that. She was having a hard time disciplining us, and a big man's presence alone would help. And if she had a man to provide, it would send the state people away forever. We all understood without ever saying much about it, or at least we had no objection. We took it in stride, even with some amusement among us, that when the man came, our mother would be all dressed up and the best that she had. She was still a good-looking woman and she would act differently, light-hearted and laughing, as we hadn't seen her act in years. It went on for about a year, I guess, and then about 1936 and 1937, the man from Lansing jilted my mother suddenly. He just stopped coming to see her. From what I later understood, he finally backed away from taking on the responsibility of those eight mouths to feed. He was afraid of so many of us. To this day, I can see the trap that Mother was in, saddled with all of us. I can also understand why he would shun taking on such a tremendous responsibility. But it was a terrible shock to her. It was the beginning of the end of reality for my mother. And she began to sit around and walk around talking to herself, almost as though she was unaware that we were there. It became increasingly terrifying. The state people saw her weakening. That was when they began the definite steps to take me away from home. They began to tell me how nice it was going to be at the Gohannes home, where the Gohannes had all said how much they liked me and would like to have me live with them. I liked all of them, too, but I didn't want to leave Wilfred. I looked up to and admired my big brother. I didn't want to leave Hilda, who was like my second mother, or Filbert. Even in our fighting, there was a feeling of brotherly union. Or Reginald, especially, who was weak with his hernia condition and who looked up to me as his big brother who looked out for him as I looked up to Wilfred. And I had nothing either against the babies Yvonne, Wesley, and Robert. As my mother talked to herself more and more, she gradually became less responsive to us and less responsible. The house became less tidy. We began to be more unkempt. And usually now, Hilda cooked. We children watched our anchor giving way. 
It was something terrible that you couldn't get your hands on, yet you couldn't get away from. It was a sense in that something bad was going to happen. We younger ones leaned more and more heavily on the relative strength of Wilfred and Hilda, who were the oldest. When finally I was sent to the Gohannis house, at least in a surface way, I was glad. I remember that when I left home with the state man, my mother said one thing. Don't let them feed him any pig. It was better in a lot of ways at the Gohannis. Big boy and I shared his room together, and we hit it off nicely. He just wasn't the same as my blood brothers. The Gohannis were very religious people. Big Boy and I attended church with him. They were sanctified holy rollers now. The preachers and congregations jumped even high and shouted even louder than the Baptists I had known. They sang at the top of their lungs and swayed back and forth and cried and moaned and beat on tambourines and chanted. It was spooky with ghosts and spirituals and haints seeming to be in the very atmosphere when finally we all came out of the church going back home. Mr. Gohannis was close cronies with some of the other men who, some Saturdays, would take me and Big Boy with them hunting rabbits. I had my father's twenty-two caliber rifle. My mother had said it was all right for me to take it with me. The old men had a set rabbit hunting strategy that they had always used. Usually when a dog jumps a rabbit and the rabbit gets away, the rabbit will always somehow instinctively run in a circle and return sooner or later past the very spot where he originally was jumped. Well, the old men would just sit and wait somewhere for the rabbit to come back, then get their shots at him. I got to thinking about it. And finally I thought of a plan. I would separate from them and Big Boy, and I would go to a point where I figured that the rabbit returning would have to pass me first. It worked like magic. I began to get three and four rabbits before they got one. The astonishing thing was that none of the old men ever figured out why. <laughs> they outdid themselves, exclaiming what a sure shot I was. I was about twelve then. All I had done was to improve on their strategy, and it was the beginning of a very important lesson in life. That any time you find someone more successful than you are, especially when you're both engaged in the same business, you know they're doing something that you aren't. Eventually, my mother suffered a complete breakdown, and the court orders were finally signed. They took her to the state mental hospital at Kalamazoo. It was 70-some miles from Lansing, about an hour and a half on the bus. A Judge McClellan and Lansing had authority over me and all my brothers and sisters. We were state children, court wards. He had the full say-so over us, a white man in charge of a black man's children. Nothing but legal modern slavery, however kindly intentioned. My mother remained in the same hospital at Kalamazoo for about 26 years. Later, when I was still growing up in Michigan, I would go to visit her every so often. Nothing that I can imagine could have moved me so deeply as seeing her pitiful state. In 1963, we got my mother out of the hospital, and she now lives there in Lansing with Philbert and his family. It was so much worse than if it had been a physical sickness, for which a cause might have been known, medicine given, a cure effected. Every time I visited her, when finally they led her, a case, a number, back inside from where we had been sitting together, I felt worse. My last visit, when I knew I would never come to see her again, there, was in 1952. I was 27. My brother Philbert had told me that on his last visit she had recognized him somewhat, in spots, he said. But she didn't recognize me at all. She stared at me. She didn't know who I was. Her mind, when I tried to talk to reach her, was somewhere else. I asked, Mama, do you know what day it is? She said, staring, All the people have gone. I can't 
describe how I felt. The woman who had brought me into the world and nursed me and advised me and chastised me and loved me didn't know me. It was as if I was trying to walk up the side of a hill of feathers. I looked at her. I listened to her talk. But there was nothing I could do. I truly believe that if ever a state social agency destroyed a family, it destroyed ours. We wanted and tried to stay together. Our home didn't have to be destroyed, but the welfare, the courts, and the doctor gave us the one, two, three punch, and ours was not the only case of this kind. I knew I wouldn't be back to see my mother again because it could make me a very vicious and dangerous person. Knowing how they had looked at us as numbers and as a case in their book, not as human beings. And knowing that my mother in there was a statistic that didn't have to be, that existed because of a society's failure, hypocrisy, greed, and lack of mercy and compassion. Hence, I have no mercy or compassion in me for a society that will crush people and then penalize them for not being able to stand up under the weight. I have rarely talked to anyone about my mother, for I believe that I am capable of killing a person without hesitation who happened to make the wrong kind of remark about my mother. So I purposely don't make any opening for some fool to step into. Back when our family was destroyed in 1937, Wilfred and Hilda were old enough so that the state let them stay on their own in the big four-room house that my father had built. Philbert was placed with another family in Lanson, a Mrs. Hackett, while Reginald and Wesley went to live with a family called Williams, who were friends of my mother's, and Yvonne and Robert went to live with a West Indian family named McGuire. Separated though we were, all of us maintained fairly close touch around Lanson, in school and out, whenever we could get together. Despite the artificially created separation and distance between us, we still remained very close in our feelings toward each other. Not long after this, I came into a classroom with my hat on. I did it deliberately. The teacher, who was white, ordered me to keep the hat on and to walk around and around the room until he told me to stop. That way, he said, everyone can see you. Meanwhile, we'll go on with the class for those who are here to learn something. I was still walking around when he got up from his desk and turned to the blackboard to write something on it. Everyone in the classroom was looking when, at this moment, I passed behind his desk, snatched up a thumbtack, and deposited it in his chair. When he turned to sit back down, I was far from the scene of the crime, circling around the rear of the room. Then he hit the tack and I heard him holler and caught a glimpse of him spraddling up as I disappeared through the door. With my deportment record, I wasn't really shocked when the decision came that I had been expelled. I guess I must have had some vague idea that if I didn't have to go to school, I'd be allowed to stay on with the Gohannas and wander around town or maybe get a job if I wanted one for pocket money. But I got rocked on my heels when a state man whom I hadn't seen before came and got me at the Gohannas and took me down to court. They told me I was going to reform school. I was still 13 years old. Malcolm was sent to live in a detention home in Mason, a small town about 12 miles from Lansing. There he became, as he called it, the mascot of the couple who ran the home, a Mr. and Mrs. Swirlin. The Swirlins were clearly impressed with Malcolm's intelligence. They gave him small jobs to do around their house, and eventually got him a job washing dishes in a local restaurant. But they often spoke disparagingly of niggers in front of him, as if he weren't there. The same way, Malcolm X wrote, people would talk freely in front of a pet canary. Instead of reform school, Malcolm became the first ward of the detention home ever to be placed in Mason Junior High School, where he was a top student and was even elected president of his seventh grade class. And where his history teacher was particularly fond of telling nigger jokes in Malcolm's presence. When Malcolm told his English teacher, whom he had regarded as a friend and advisor, 
that he'd like to be a lawyer one day. The instructor told him, that's no realistic goal for a nigger. You're good with your hands. Why don't you plan on carpentry? After this incident, Malcolm became increasingly withdrawn, especially from white people. He also began to get restless. During the summer of his 14th year, he visited his half-sister, Ella, in Boston. A commanding woman, he wrote of her. The way she sat, moved, talked, did everything, bespoke somebody who did and got exactly what she wanted. Ella had come north from Georgia with nothing, and she had worked hard and invested her savings in property. I had never been so impressed with anybody, Malcolm noted, and he was equally impressed with the excitement of life in the big city. When he finished eighth grade at Mason Junior High, he left Michigan and moved into Ella's house in the Warmbeck and Humboldt Avenue hill section of Roxbury, Boston's largest black neighborhood. The hill, as it was known, was considered an exclusive area where many black professionals lived, teachers, preachers, Pullman porters, bank janitors, and other members of the black community's elite. Ella told Malcolm to enjoy himself, to get to know the neighborhood, and when the time was right, she'd help him find a job. But Malcolm was not attracted to the status of the hill. He was drawn to the nightlife, to the jazz and the lights, and he began to roam, late and wide, through the streets of Boston. I spent my first month in town with my mouth hanging open. The sharp-dressed young cats who hung on the corners and in the pool rooms, bars and restaurants, and who obviously didn't work anywhere, completely entranced me. I couldn't get over marveling how their hair was straight and shiny like white men's hair. Ella told me this was called a conch. I had never tasted a sip of liquor, never even smoked a cigarette, and here I saw little black children, 10 and 12 years old, shooting craps, playing cards, fighting, getting grown-ups to put a penny or a nickel on their number for them, things like that. And these children threw around swear words I had never even heard before, even, and slang expressions that were just as new to me, such as stud and cat, chick and cool and hip. Every night as I lay in bed, I turned these new words over in my mind. It was shocking to me that in town, especially after dark, you'd occasionally see a white girl and a Negro man strolling arm in arm along the sidewalk and mixed couples drinking in the neon-lighted bars, not slipping off to some dark corner, as in Lansing. I wanted to find a job myself to surprise Ella. One afternoon, something told me to go inside a pool room whose window I was looking through. I'd looked through that window many times. I wasn't yearning to play pool. In fact, I had never held a cue stick. But I was drawn by the sight of the cool-looking cat standing around inside, bending over the big green felt-top tables, making bets and shooting the bright-colored balls into the holes. As I stared through the window this particular afternoon, something made me decide to venture inside and talk to a dark, stubby, conch-headed fellow who racked up balls for the pool players, whom I'd heard called Shorty. One day, he had come outside and seen me standing there, and he said, Hi, Red. So that made me figure he was friendly. As inconspicuously as I could, I slipped inside the door and around the side of the pool room, avoiding people, and on to the back where Shorty was filling an aluminum can with powder the pool player's dust on their hands. He looked up at me. Later on, Shorty would enjoy teasing me about how, with that first glance, he knew my whole story. Man, that cat still smell country, he'd say laughing. Cat's legs were so long, his pants so short, his knees showed, and his head looked like a briar patch. But that afternoon, Shorty didn't let it show in his face how country I'd appeared when I told him I'd appreciate it if he'd tell me how could somebody go about getting a job like his. If you mean racking up balls, said Shorty, I don't know of no pool joints around here needing anybody. You mean you just want any slave you can find? Uh, a slave meant work, a job. He asked me what kind of work I had done. I told him that I'd washed restaurant dishes in Mason, Michigan. He nearly dropped that powder can. My homeboy, man, give me some skin. I'm from Lansing. I never told Shorty, and he never suspected that he was about ten years older than I. He took us to be about the same age. 
First, I would have been embarrassed to tell him. Later, I just never bothered. Shorty had dropped out of first-year high school in Lansing, lived a while with an uncle and aunt in Detroit, and had spent the last six years living with his cousin in Roxbury. But when I mentioned the names of Lansing, people, and places, he remembered many, and pretty soon we sounded as if we had been raised in the same block. I could sense Shorty's genuine gladness, and I don't have to say how lucky I felt to find a friend as hip as he obviously was. Man, this is a swinging town, if you dig it, Shorty said. You're my homeboy. I'm going to school you to the happenings. I stood there and grinned like a fool. You got to go anywhere now? Well, stick around till I get off. One thing I liked immediately about Shorty was his frankness. When I told him where I lived, he said what I already knew, that nobody in town could stand the Hill Negroes. But he thought a sister who gave me a pad, not charging me rent, not even running me out to find some slave, couldn't be all bad. Shorty's slave in the pool room, he said, was just to keep ends together while he learned his horn. A couple of years before, he'd hit the numbers and bought a saxophone. Got it right here in the closet now for my lesson tonight. Shorty was taking lessons with some other studs, and he intended one day to organize his own small band. There's a lot of bread to be made gigging right around here in Roxbury, Shorty explained to me. I don't dig joining some big band one night and all over just to say I played with Count or Duke or somebody. I thought that was smart. I wished I had studied a horn, but I'd never been exposed to one. Through the afternoon, Shorty introduced me to players and lounges. My homeboy, he'd say. He's looking for a slave if you hear anything. They all said they'd look out. At seven o'clock when the night ball racket came on, Shorty told me he had to hurry to a saxophone lesson. But before he left, he held out to me the six or seven dollars he had collected that day in nickel and dime tips. You got enough bread, homeboy? I was okay, I told him. I had two dollars. But Shorty made me take three more. A little fattening for your pocket, he said. Before we went out, he opened his saxophone case and showed me the horn. It was gleaming brass against the green velvet, an alto sax. He said, keep cool, homeboy, and come back tomorrow. Some of the cats will turn you up a slave. Malcolm's first big city job was shining shoes at the Roseland State Ballroom. Besides dancers and drunks, he shined the shoes of Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Cootie Williams, Lionel Hampton, and many other famous musicians who played the Roseland. He also learned his first hustles there, setting up white customers with black whores and selling liquor and reefers on the side. Shorty showed Malcolm the wonders of buying on credit. Malcolm bought his first zoot suit, and when his hair grew long enough, Shorty decided it was time for Malcolm's first conk. I took the little list of ingredients he had printed out for me and went to a grocery store where I got a can of Red Devil Lye, two eggs, and two medium-sized white potatoes. Then at a drugstore near the pool room, I asked for a large jar of Vaseline, a large bar of soap, a large tooth comb, and a fine tooth comb. One of those rubber hoses with a metal spray head, a rubber apron, and a pair of gloves. Gonna lay on that first conk, the drugstore man asked me. I proudly told him, grinning, right. Shorty paid six dollars a week for a room in his cousin's shabby apartment. His cousin wasn't at home. It's like the pad's mine. He spends so much time with his woman, Shorty said. Now, you watch me. He peeled the potatoes and thin sliced them into a quart-sized mason fruit jar, then started stirring them with a wooden spoon as he gradually poured in a little over half the can of lye. Never use a metal spoon. The lye will turn it black, he told me. A jelly-like, starchy-looking glop resulted from the lying potatoes. And Shorty broke in the two eggs, stirring real fast. His own conch and dark face bent down close. The congoline turned pale yellowish. Feel the jar, Shorty said. I cut my hand against the outside and snatched it away. Damn right, it's hot. That's the lie, he said. So you know it's gonna burn when I come in, and it burns bad. But the longer you can stand it, the straighter the hair. He made me sit down, and he tied the string of the new rubber apron tightly around my neck and combed up my bush of hair. Then from the big Vaseline jar, I took a handful and massaged it hard all through my hair and into the scalp. He also thickly Vaseline my neck, ears, and forehead. When I get to washing out your head, be sure to tell me anywhere you feel any stinging, Shorty warned me. 
washing his hands and then pulling on rubber gloves and tying on his own rubber apron. You always got to remember that any congolene left in burns a saw into your head. The congolene just felt warm when Shorty started combing it in. But then my head caught fire. I gritted my teeth and tried to pull the sides of the kitchen table together. The comb felt as if it was raking my skin off. My eyes watered, my nose was running. I couldn't stand it any longer. I bolted to the wash basin. I was cursing Shorty with every name I could think of when he got the spray going and started soap lathering my head. He lathered and spray rinsed, lathered and spray rinsed maybe ten or twelve times, each time gradually closing the hot water faucet until the rinse was cold, and that helped some. You feel any stinging spots? No, nah, I managed to say. My knees were trembling. Sit back down, then. I think we got it all out okay. The flame came back as Shorty with a thick towel started drying my head, rubbing hard. Easy, man, easy, I kept shouting. First time's always the worst. You get used to it better before long. You took it real good, homeboy. You got a good conk. When Shorty let me stand up and see in the mirror, my hair hung down in limp, damp strands. My scalp still flamed, but not as badly. I could bear it. He draped the towel around my shoulders over my rubber apron and began again Vaseline in my hair. I could feel him combing, straight back, first the big comb, then the fine tooth one. Then he was using a razor very delicately on the back of my neck, then finally shaping the sideburns. My first view in the mirror blotted out the hurting. I'd seen some pretty conks, but when it's the first time on your own head, the transformation after a lifetime of kinks is staggering. The mirror reflected Shorty behind me. We both were grinning and sweating. And on top of my head was this thick, smooth sheen of shining red hair, real red, as straight as any white man's. <laughs> How ridiculous I was. Stupid enough to stand there, simply lost in admiration of my hair now looking white, reflected in the mirror in Shorty's room. I vowed that I'd never again be without a conch, and I never was for many years. This was my first really big step towards self-degradation. When I endured all that pain, literally burning my flesh to have it look like a white man's hair, I had joined that multitude of Negro men and women in America who are so brainwashed into believing that black people are inferior and white people are superior that they will even violate and mutilate their God-created bodies to try to look pretty by white standards. Malcolm moved easily into the hip-city life of the Boston ghetto. He spoke the jive, drank the liquor, smoked the reefers and cigarettes, and he learned to dance. Lindy hopping was the craze of the day, and Malcolm became a Lindy hopping star. At 16, he acquired the ultimate black hipster status symbol, a white woman. Sophia, as he called her, it was not her real name, was vague about her background, but she was clearly well off and infatuated with black men, especially Malcolm. For months, he paraded her through the black bars and clubs. Through his sister Ella, Malcolm landed a new job selling sandwiches on the Yankee Clipper, the train that ran from Boston to New York. And in New York, he discovered Harlem, the fabulous nightlife that dwarfed what he had known in Boston, the hookers, pimps, and con artists who made up what Malcolm called the Technicolor Bazaar that stretched along Lenox between 7th and 8th Avenues, the Apollo Theater, and the Savoy Ballroom, the bar at the Braddock Hotel where the great black musicians congregated Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Dinah Washington. Malcolm dreamed of becoming part of it, and shortly after his 17th birthday, he made the move. He found a job in the center of the action as a day waiter at Small's Paradise, one of Harlem's hippest bars. Every day in Small's Paradise Bar was fascinating to me, and from a Harlem point of view, I couldn't have been in a more educational situation. Some of the ablest of New York's black hustlers took a liking to me, and knowing that I was still green by their terms, soon began in a paternal way to straighten red out. Their methods would be indirect. A dark, businessman-looking West Indian often would sit at one of my tables. One day when I brought his beer, he said, Red, hold still a minute. He went over me with one of those yellow tape measures and jotted figures in his notebook. 
When I came to work the next afternoon, one of the bartenders handed me a package. It was an expensive, dark blue suit, conservatively cut. The gift was thoughtful, and the message was clear. The bartenders let me know that this customer was one of the top executives of the fabulous Forty Thieves gang. That was the gang of organized boosters who would deliver to order in one day COD any kind of garment you desired. You would pay about one-third the store's price. Plain-clothes detectives soon were quietly identified to me by a nod, a wink. Knowing the law in the area was elementary for the hustlers, and like them in time I would learn to sense the presence of any police types. In late 1942, each of the military services had their civilian dress eyes and ears picking up anything of interest to them, such as hustles being used to avoid the draft, or who hadn't registered, or hustles that were being worked on servicemen. Longshoremen, or fences for them, would come into the bar selling guns, cameras, perfumes, watches, and the like stolen from the shipping docks. These Negroes got what white longshoremen thievery left over. Merchant marine sailors often brought in foreign items, bargains, and the best marijuana cigarettes to be had were made of the ganja and kiska that merchant sailors smuggled in from Africa and Persia. In the daytime, whites were given a guarded treatment. Whites who came at night got a better reception. The several Harlem nightclubs they patronized were geared to entertain and jive the night white crowd to get their money. And with so many law agencies guarding the morals of servicemen, any of them that came in, and a lot did, were given what they asked for, and were spoken to if they spoke, and that was all, unless someone knew them as natives of Harlem. What I was learning was the Hustlin' Society's first rule, that you never trusted anyone outside of your own closed-mouthed circle, and that you selected with time and care before you made any intimates even among these. The bartenders would let me know which among the regular customers were mostly fronts, which really had something going, which were really in the underworld with downtown police or political connections, which really handled some money, and which were making it from day to day, which were the real gamblers, and which had just hit a little luck, and which ones never to run afoul of in any way. The latter were extremely well known about Harlem, and they were feared and respected. It was known that if upset, they would break open your head and think nothing of it. These were old-timers, not to be confused with the various hot-headed, wild young hustlers out trying to make a name for themselves for being crazy with a pistol trigger or a knife. The old heads that I'm talking about were such as Black Sammy, Bub Hewlett, King Padmore, and West Indian Archie. Most of these tough ones had worked as strong-arm men for Dutch Schultz when he had muscled into the Harlem numbers industry after white gangsters had awakened to the fortunes being made in what they had previously considered nigger pennies, and the numbers game was referred to by the white racketeers as nigger pool. Those tough Negroes' heyday had been before the big 1931 Seabury investigation that started Dutch Schultz on the way out until his career ended with his 1934 assassination. I heard stories of how they had persuaded people with lead pipes, wet cement, baseball bats, brass knuckles, fists, feet, and blackjacks. Nearly every one of them had done some time and had come back on the scene and since had worked as top runners for the biggest bankers who specialized in large betters. There seemed to be an understanding that these Negroes and the tough black cops never clashed. I guess both knew that someone would die. They had some bad black cops in Harlem, too. The four horsemen that worked Sugar Hill, I remember the worst one had freckles. There was a tough quartet. The biggest, blackest, worst cop of them all in Harlem was the West Indian Brisbane. Negroes crossed the street to avoid him when he walked his 125th Street and 7th Avenue beat. When I was in prison, someone brought me a story that Brisbane had been shot to death by a scared, nervous young kid who hadn't been up from the South long enough to realize how bad Brisbane was. The world's most unlikely pimp was Cadillac Drake. He was shiny, bald-headed, built like a football. He used to call his huge belly the Chippy's Playground. Cadillac had a, a string of about a dozen of the stringiest, scrawniest, black-and-white street prostitutes in Harlem. Just about the complete opposite of Cadillac was the young, smooth, independent acting pimp, Sammy the Pimp. Sammy and I became in time each other's closest friend. 
Sammy, who was from Kentucky, was a cool, collected expert in his business, and his business was women. Like Cadillac, he too both had black and white women out making his living. But Sammy's women, who would come into small sometimes looking for him to give him money and have him buy them a drink, were about as beautiful as any prostitutes who operated anywhere, I'd imagine. There was a big, fat pimp we called Dollar Bill. He loved to flash his Kansas City roll, probably fifty one-dollar bills folded with a twenty on the inside and a hundred-dollar bill on the outside. We always wondered what Dollar Bill would do if someone ever stole his hundred-dollar cover. A man who, in his prime, could have stolen Dollar Bill's whole roll blindfolded was threadbare, comic old few clothes. Few clothes had been one of the best pickpockets in Harlem back when the white people swarmed up every night in the 1920s. But then during the Depression, he had contracted a bad case of arthritis in his hands. His finger joints were knotted and gnarled so that it made people uncomfortable to look at them. Rain, sleet, or snow every afternoon about six, few clothes would be at Smalls, telling tall tales about the old days. And it was one of the day's rituals for one or another regular customer to ask the bartender to give him drinks and me defeat him. My heart goes out to all of us who were in those afternoons at Smalls and acted our scene with few clothes. I wish you could have seen him, pleasantly high with drinks, take his seat with dignity, no begging, not on anybody's welfare, and open his napkin and study the day's menu that I gave him and place his order. I tell the cooks it was for few clothes and he'd get the best in the house. I'd go back and serve it as though he were a millionaire. Many times since, I've thought about it and what it really meant. In one sense, we were huddled in there, bonded together in seeking security and warmth and comfort from each other, and we didn't know it. All of us who might have probed space or cured cancer or built industries were instead black victims of the white man's American social system. In another sense, the tragedy of the once master pickpocket made him, for those brother old-timer hustlers, a there but for the grace of God symbol. To wolves who were still able to catch some rabbits, it had meaning that an old wolf who had lost his fangs was still eaten. When I had been around Harlem long enough to show signs of permanence, inevitably I got a nickname that would identify me beyond any confusion with two other red-conked and well-known reds who were around. I had met them both. In fact, later on I'd worked with them both. One, St. Louis Red, was a professional armed robber. When I was sent to prison, he was serving time for trying to stick up a dining car steward on a train between New York and Philadelphia. He was finally freed. Now I hear he's in prison for a New York City jewel robbery. The other was Chicago Red. We became good buddies in a speakeasy where later on I was a waiter. Chicago Red was the funniest dishwasher on this earth. Now he's making his living being funny as a nationally known stage and nightclub comedian. I don't see any reason why old Chicago Red would mind me telling that he is Red Fox. Anyway... Before long, my nickname happened. Just when, I don't know, but people, knowing I was from Michigan, would ask me what city. Since most New Yorkers had never heard of Lansing, I would say Detroit. Gradually, I began to be called Detroit Red, and it stuck. One afternoon in early 1943, before the regular six o'clock crowd had gathered, a black soldier sat drinking by himself at one of my tables. He must have been there an hour or more. He looked dumb and pitiful and just up from the deep south. The fourth or fifth drink I served this soldier, wiping the table, I bent over close and asked him if he wanted a woman. I knew better. It wasn't only Small's paradise law, it was the law of every tavern that wanted to stay in business. Never get involved with anything that could be interpreted as impairing the morals of servicemen or any kind of hustling off them. This had caused trouble for dozens of places. Some had been put off limits by the military. Some had lost their state or city licenses. I played right into the hands of a military spy. He sure would like a woman. He acted so grateful he even put on an extreme southern accent. And I gave him the phone number of one of my best friends among the prostitutes where I lived. 
but something felt wrong. I gave the fellow a half hour to get there, and then I telephoned. I expected the answer I got, that no soldier had been there. I didn't even bother to go back out to the bar. I just went straight to Charlie Small's office. I just did something, Charlie, I said. I don't know why I did it, and I told him. Charlie looked at me. I wish you hadn't done that, Red. We both knew what he meant. When the West Indian plain clothes detective Joe Baker came in, I was waiting. I didn't even ask him any questions. When we got to the 135th Street precinct, it was busy with police in uniform and the MPs with soldiers in tow. I was recognized by some other detectives who, like Joe Baker, sometimes dropped in at Smalls. Two things were in my favor. I'd never given the police any trouble, and when that black spy soldier had tried to tip me, I had waved it away, telling him I was just doing him a favor. They must have agreed that Joe Baker should just scare me. I didn't know enough to be aware that I wasn't taken to the desk and booked. Joe Baker took me back inside of the precinct building into a small room. In the next room, we could hear somebody getting whipped. Whop! Whop! He'd cry out, Please! Oh, please don't beat my face! That's how I make my living! I knew that it was some pimp. Whop! Whop! Please! Please! More bitter than getting fired, I was barred from Smalls. I, I could understand... Even if I wasn't actually what was called hot, I was now going to be under surveillance, and the Small Brothers had to protect their business. Sammy proved to be my friend in need. He put word on the wire for me to come over to his place. I'd never been there. His place seemed to me a small palace. His women really kept him in style. While we talked about what kind of a hustle I should get into, Sammy gave me some of the best marijuana I'd ever used. Various numbers controllers, Smalls regulars, had offered me jobs as a runner, but that meant I would earn very little until I could build up a clientele. Pimping, as Sammy did, was out. I felt I had no abilities in that direction, and that I'd certainly starve to death trying to recruit prostitutes. Peddling reefers, Sammy and I pretty soon agreed, was the best thing. It was a relatively uninvolved, lone wolf type of operation, and one in which I could make money immediately. For anyone with even a little brains, no experience was needed, especially if one had any knack at all with people. Both Sam and I knew some merchant seamen and others who could supply me with loose marijuana, and musicians, among whom I had so many good contacts, were the heaviest consistent market for reefers. And then, musicians also used the heavier narcotics if I later wanted to graduate to them. That would be more risky, but also more money. Handling heroin and cocaine could earn one hundreds of dollars a day, but it required a lot of experience with the narcotics squad for one to be able to last long enough to make anything. I'd been around long enough either to know or to spot instinctively most regular detectives and cops, though not the narcotics people. And among the Smalls veteran hustler regulars, I had a variety of potentially helpful contacts. This was important because just as Sammy could get me supplied with marijuana, a large facet of any hustler's success was knowing where he could get help when he needed it. The help could involve police and detectives as well as higher-ups. But I hadn't yet reached that stage, so Sammy staked me about $20, I think it was. Later that same night, I knocked at his door and gave him back his money and asked him if I could lend him some. I'd gone straight from Sammy's to a supplier he had mentioned, I got just a small amount of marijuana, and I got some of the paper to roll up my own sticks. I was able to make enough of them so that, after selling them to musicians I knew at the Braddock Hotel, I could pay back Sammy and have enough profit to be in business. And those musicians, when they saw their buddy and their fan in business, my man, crazy red. I kept turning over my profit, increasing my supplies, and I sold reefers like a wild man. I scarcely slept. I was wherever musicians congregated. A roll of money was in my pocket. Every day I cleared at least 50 or 60 dollars. In those days, this was a fortune to a 17-year-old Negro. I felt for the first time in my life that great feeling of free. Suddenly now, I was the peer of the other young hustlers I had admired. 
Around Harlem, the narcotics squad detectives didn't take long to find out I was selling reefers and occasionally one of them would follow me. Many a peddler was in jail because he had been caught with the evidence on his person. I figured a way to avoid that. The law specified that if the evidence wasn't actually in your possession, you couldn't be arrested. Hollowed out shoe heels, fake hat linings, these things were old stuff to the detectives. I carried about 50 sticks in a small package inside my coat, under my armpit, keeping my arm flat against my side. Moving about, I kept my eyes open. If anybody looked suspicious, I'd quickly cross the street or go through a door or turn a corner loosed in my arm enough to let the package drop. At night, when I usually did my selling, any suspicious person wouldn't be likely to see the trick. If I decided I had been mistaken, I'd go back and get my sticks. However, I lost many a stick this way. Sometimes I knew I had frustrated a detective, and I kept out of the courts. One morning, though, I came in and found signs that my room had been entered. I knew it had been detectives. I'd heard too many times how if they couldn't find any evidence, they would plant some. Well, you would never find it, then they'd come back in and find it. I didn't even have to think twice what to do. I packed my few belongings and never looked back. When I went to sleep again, it was in another room. It was then that I began carrying a little twenty-five automatic. I got it for some reefers from an addict who I knew had stolen it somewhere. I carried it pressed under my belt right under the center of my back. Someone had told me that the cops never hit there in a routine patting down, and unless I knew who I was with, I never allowed myself to get caught in any crush of people. The narcotics cops had been known to rush up and get their hands on you and plant evidence while searching. I felt that as long as I kept on the go and in the open, I had a good chance. I don't know now what my real thoughts were about carrying the pistol, but I imagine I felt that I wasn't going to get put away if somebody tried framing me in any situation that I could help. I sold less than before because of having to be so careful consume so much time. Every now and then on a hunch I'd move to another room. I told nobody but Sammy where I slept. Finally, it was on the wire that the Harlem Narcotics Squad had me on its special list. Now, every other day or so, usually in some public place, they would flash the badge and search me. But I'd tell them at once, loud enough for others standing about to hear me, that I had nothing on me and I didn't want to get anything planted on me. Then they wouldn't because Harlem already thought little enough of the law, and they did have to be careful that some crowd of Negroes would not intervene roughly. Negroes were starting to get very tense in Harlem. One could almost smell trouble ready to break out, as it did very soon. But it was really tough on me then. I was having to hide my sticks in various places near where I was selling. I put five sticks in an empty cigarette pack and dropped the empty-looking pack by a lamppost or behind a garbage can or a box and I'd first tell my customers to pay me, and then where to pick up. But my regular customers didn't go for that. You couldn't expect a well-known musician to go grubbing behind a garbage can. So I began to pick up some of the street trade. The people you could see looked high. I collected a number of empty Red Cross bandage boxes and used them for drops. That worked pretty good. But the middle Harlem narcotics force found so many ways to harass me that I had to change my area. I moved down to Lower Harlem around 110th Street. There were more reefer smokers around there, but these were a cheaper type. This is the worst of the ghetto, the poorest people, the ones who in every ghetto kept themselves narcotized to keep from having to face their miserable existence. I didn't last long down there, either. I lost too much for my product. After I sold to some of those reefer smokers who had the instincts of animals, they followed me and learned my pattern. They'd dart out of a doorway, I'd drop my stuff, and they would be on it like a chicken on corn. When you become an animal, a vulture in the ghetto, as I had become, you enter a world of animals and vultures. It becomes truly the survival of only the fittest. Soon I found myself borrowing little stakes from Sammy, from some of the musicians, enough to buy supplies, enough to keep high myself, enough sometimes just to eat. Then Sammy gave me an idea. Red, you still got your old railroad identification? I did have it. They hadn't taken it back. Well, why don't you use it to make a few runs until the heat cools? He was right. I found that if you walked up and showed a railroad line's employee identification card, 
The conductor, even a real cracker if you approached him right, not begging, would just wave you aboard. And when he came around, he would punch you one of those little coach seat slips to ride wherever the train went. The idea came to me that this way I could travel all over the East Coast selling reefers among my friends who were on tour with their bands. I had the New Haven identification. I worked a couple of weeks for other railroads to get their identification, and then I was set. In New York, I rolled and packed a great quantity of sticks and sealed them into jars. The identification card worked perfectly. If you persuaded the conductor you were a fellow employee who had to go home on some family business, he just did the favor for you without a second thought. Most whites don't give a Negro credit for having sense enough to fool him or nerve enough. I'd turn up in towns where my friends were playing. Red! I was an old friend from home. In the sticks, I was somebody from the Braddock Hotel. My man, Daddy O! And I had big apple reefers. Nobody had ever heard of a traveling reefer peddler. I followed no particular band. Each band's musicians knew the other band's one-nighter touring schedules. When I ran out of supplies, I'd return to New York and I'd load up, then hit the road again. Auditoriums or gymnasiums all lighted up, the bands charted bus outside, the dressed-up, excited local dancers pouring in. At the door, I'd announce that I was some bandman's brother. In most cases, they thought I was one of the musicians. Throughout the dance, I'd show the country folks some plain and fancy Lindy hopping. Sometimes I'd stay overnight in a town. Sometimes I'd ride the band's bus to the next stop. Sometimes back in New York, I would stay a while. Things had cooled down. Word was around that I had left town and the narcotics squad was satisfied with that. In some of the small towns, people thinking I was with the band even mobbed me for autographs. Once in Buffalo, my suit was nearly torn off. My brother Reginald was waiting for me one day when I pulled into New York. The day before, his merchant ship had put into port over in New Jersey. Thinking I still worked at Smalls, Reginald had gone there and the bartenders had directed him to Sammy, who put him up. It felt good to see my brother. It was hard to believe that he was once the little kid who tagged after me. Reginald now was almost six feet tall, but still a few inches shorter than me. His complexion was darker than mine, but he had greenish eyes and a white streak in his hair, which was otherwise dark red or something like mine. I took Reginald everywhere, introducing him. Studying my brother, I liked him. He was a lot more self-possessed than I had been at sixteen. I didn't have a room right at the time, but I had some money... So did Reginald, and we checked into the St. Nicholas Hotel on Sugar Hill. It has since been torn down. Reginald and I talked all night about the Lansing years, about our family. I told him things about our father and mother that he couldn't remember. Then Reginald filled me in on our brothers and sisters. Wilfred was a trade instructor at Wilberforce University. Hilda, still in Lansing, was talking of getting married, so was Filbert. Reginald and I were the next two in line, and Yvonne, Wesley, and Robert were still in Lansing in school. Reginald and I laughed about Filbert, who the last time I had seen him had gotten deeply religious. He wore one of those round straw hats. Reginald's ship was in for about a week getting some kind of repairs on its engines. I was pleased to see that Reginald, though he said little about it, admired my living by my wits. Reginald dressed a little too loudly, I thought. I got a reefer customer of mine to get him a more conservative overcoat and suit. I told Reginald what I had learned that in order to get something, you had to look as though you already had something. Before Reginald left, I urged him to leave the Merchant Marine and I would help him get started in Harlem. I must have felt that having my kid brother around me would be a good thing. Then there would be two people I could trust. Sammy was the other. Reginald was cool. At his age, I would have been willing to run behind the train to get to New York and to Harlem. But Reginald, when he left, said, oh, I'll think about it. Not long after Reginald left, I dragged out the wildest zoot suit in New York. This was 1943. The Boston Draft Board had written me at Ella's, and when they had no results there, had notified the New York Draft Board, and in care of Sammy, I received Uncle Sam's greetings. In those days, only three things in the world scared me. Jail, a job, and the army. I had about ten days before I was to show up at the induction center. I went right to work. 
The Army intelligence soldiers, those black spies in civilian clothes, hung around in Harlem with their ears open for the white man downtown. I knew exactly where to start dropping the word. I started noising around that I was frantic to join the Japanese Army. When I sensed that I had the ears of the spies, I would talk and act high and crazy. A lot of Harlem hustlers actually had reached that state, as I would later. It was inevitable when one had gone long enough on heavier and heavier narcotics and under the steadily tightening vice of the hustling life. I'd snatch out and read my greetings aloud to make certain they heard who I was and when I'd report downtown. This was probably the only time my real name was ever heard in Harlem in those days. The day I went down there, I costumed like an actor. With my wild zoot suit, I wore the yellowed knob-toe shoes, and I frizzled my hair up into a reddish bush of conch. I went in, skipping and tipping, and I thrust my tattered greetings at the reception desk's white soldier. Crazy oh, daddy oh, get me moving. I can't wait to get in that brown. Very likely that soldier hasn't recovered from me yet. They had their wire on me from uptown, all right. But they still put me through the line. In that big starting room were 40 or 50 other prospective inductees. The room had fallen vacuum quiet with me running my mouth a mile a minute talking nothing but slang. I was going to fight on all fronts. I was going to be a general man before I got done. Such talk as that. Most of them were white, of course. The tender-looking ones appeared ready to run from me. Some others had that vinegary, worst kind of nigger look, and a few were amused seeing me as the Harlem Jigaboo archetype. Also amused were some of the room's ten or twelve Negroes, but the stony-faced rest of them looked as if they were ready to sign up to go off killing somebody. They would have liked to start with me. The line moved along. Pretty soon, stripped to my shorts, I was making my eager-to-join comments in the medical examination rooms, and everybody in the white coats that I saw had 4F in his eyes. I stayed in the line longer than I expected before they siphoned me off. One of the white coats accompanied me around a turning hallway. I knew we were on the way to a head shrinker, the army psychiatrist. The receptionist there was a Negro nurse. I remember she was in her early twenties and not bad to look at. She was one of those Negro firsts. Negroes know what I'm talking about. Back then, the white man during the war was so pressed for personnel that he began letting some Negroes put down their buckets and mops and dust rags and use a pencil or sit at some desk or hold some 25-cent title. You couldn't read the Negro press for the big pictures of smug black firsts. Somebody was inside with the psychiatrist. I didn't even have to put on any act for this black girl. She was already sick of me. When finally a buzz came at her desk, she didn't send me. She went in. I knew what she was doing. She was going to make clear in advance what she thought of me. This is still one of the black man's big troubles today. Some of those so-called upper-class Negroes are so busy trying to impress on the white man that they are different from those others that they can't see that they are only helping the white man to keep his low opinion of all Negroes. And then, with her prestige in the clear, she came out and nodded to me to go in. I must say this for that psychiatrist. He tried to be objective and professional in his manner. He sat there and doodled with his blue pencil on a tablet, listening to me spiel to him for three or four minutes before he got a word in. His tack was quiet questions to get at why I was so anxious. I didn't rush him. I circled and hedged, watching him closely to let him think he was pulling what he wanted out of me. I kept jerking around backward as though somebody might be listening. I knew I was going to send him back to the books to figure out what kind of case I was. Suddenly, I sprang up and peeped under both doors, the one I'd entered and another that probably was a closet, and then I bent and whispered fast in his ear, Daddy-o, now, you and me, we're from up north here, so don't you tell nobody. I want to get sent down south. Organize them nigger soldiers, you dig? Steal us some guns and, and kill up some crackers. That psychiatrist's blue pencil dropped 
and his professional manner fell off in all directions. He stared at me as if I were a snake's egg hatching, fumbling for his red pencil. I knew I had him. I was going back out past Miss First when he said, That will be all. A 4F card came to me in the mail, and I never heard from the Army anymore and never bothered to ask why I was rejected. Malcolm's career as a traveling reefer salesman came to an abrupt end when he pulled a gun on another railroad worker in a poker game dispute at Grand Central Station. He was blackballed by the railroads and banned from the station by the police. Back on the streets of Harlem, looking for a hustle, Malcolm turned to armed robbery. He keyed himself up for jobs with drugs and stayed high the rest of the time to keep from getting nervous. Sometimes he worked alone, sometimes with Sammy the Pimp. Reginald came to town again, and this time Malcolm convinced him to stay. They got an apartment together, and Malcolm proudly showed his little brother around, introducing him to his famous musician friends, taking him to after-hours clubs like Creole Bill's, Jimmy's Chicken Shack, and Dickie Wells. After the rest of New York had closed for the night, these spots would still be jumping, packed tight with white people out to get a taste of Harlem. Malcolm was playing the numbers heavily at this time, placing his bets with West Indian Archie, one of Harlem's legendary bad guys, a former strong arm for Dutch Schultz. Archie was a natural for the numbers racket. He had a photographic memory, so he never had to write the numbers down. The police would never catch Archie carrying betting slips. Forced to lay low following a robbery attempt that went bad, Malcolm became a steerer for a Harlem madam, picking up and delivering her wealthy white clientele, many of them rich, influential, famous men who wanted bizarre sexual experiences with black hookers. Malcolm came to know the flesh trade well. He also steered occasionally for a white lesbian, who ran a stable of black male prostitutes catering exclusively to white women. Malcolm's steady diet of cocaine, opium, alcohol, and marijuana began to take its toll. He caught colds that he couldn't shake, he stayed high continually, living in a dream world. But it was about to turn into a nightmare that not even the drugs could obscure. Up in the Bronx, a Negro held up some Italian racketeers in a floating crap game. I heard about it on the wire. Whoever did it, aside from being a fool, was said to be a tall, light-skinned Negro masked with a woman's stocking. Up in Fat Man's Bar on the hill overlooking the polo grounds, I had just gone into a telephone booth. Everyone in the bar, all over Harlem in fact, was drinking up excited about the news that Branch Rickey, the Brooklyn Dodgers owner, had just signed Jackie Robinson to play in Major League Baseball with the Dodgers farm team in Montreal, which would place the time in the fall of 1945. Early in the afternoon, I had collected from West Indian Archie for a 50 cent combination bet. He had paid me $300 right out of his pocket. I was telephoning Jean Parks. Jean was one of the most beautiful women who ever lived in Harlem. She once sang with Sarah Vaughan in the Blue Bonnets, a quartet that sang with Earl Hines. For a long time, Jean and I had enjoyed a stand-in friendly deal that we'd go out and celebrate when either of us hit the numbers. Since my last hit, Jean had treated me twice, and we laughed on the phone glad that now I'd treat her to a night out. We arranged to go to a 52nd Street nightclub to hear Billie Holiday who had been on the road and was just back in New York. As I hung up, I spotted the two lean, tough-looking paisanos gazing in at me cooped up in the booth. I didn't need any intuition, and I had no gun. A cigarette case was the only thing in my pocket. I started easing my hand down into my pocket to try bluffing, and one of them snatched open the door. There were dark, olive, swarthy-featured Italians. I had my hand down into my pocket. Come outside, we'll hold court, one said. At that moment, a cop walked through the front door. But two thugs slipped out. I never in my life have been so glad to see a cop. I was still shaken when I got to the apartment of my friend Sammy the Pimp. He told me that not long before, West Indian Archie had been there looking for me. Sometimes recalling all of this, I don't know to tell the truth how I am alive to tell it today. They say God takes care of fools and babies. I've so often thought that Allah was watching over me. 
Through all of this time in my life, I really was dead. Mentally dead. I just didn't know that I was. Anyway, to kill time, Sammy and I sniffed some of his cocaine until the time came to pick up Gene Parks to go down and hear Lady Day. Sammy's having told me about West Indian Archie looking for me didn't mean a thing. Not right then. There was the knocking at the door. Sammy lying on his bed in pajamas and bathrobe called, Who? When West Indian Archie answered, Sammy slid the round, two-sided shaving mirror under the bed with what little of the cocaine powder or crystals, actually, was left, and I opened the door. Red, I want my money. A thirty-two twenty is a funny kind of gun. It's bigger than a thirty-two. It's not as big as a thirty-eight. I had faced down some dangerous Negroes, but no one who wasn't ready to die messed with West Indian Archie. I couldn't believe it. He truly scared me. I was so incredulous at what was happening, it was hard to form words with my brain and my mouth. Man, what's the beef? West Indian Archie said he thought I was trying something when I told him I'd hit, but he'd paid me the $300 until he could double-check his written betting slips. And as he'd thought, I hadn't combinated the number I'd claimed, but another. Man, you're crazy. I talked fast. I'd seen out of the corner of my eyes Sammy's hand easing under his pillow where he kept his army forty-five. Archie, smarter man as you're supposed to be, you'd pay somebody who hadn't hit? The thirty-two twenty moved, and Sammy froze. West Indian Archie told him, I ought to shoot you right through the ear. And he looked back at me. You don't have my money. I must have shaken my head. I'll give you until twelve o'clock tomorrow. And he put his hand behind him and pulled open the door. He backed out and slammed it. It was a classic hustler code impasse. The money wasn't the problem. I still had about $200 of it. Had money been the issue, Sammy could have made up the difference. If it wasn't in his pocket, his women could quickly have raised it. West Indian Archie himself, for that matter, would have loaned me $300 if I'd asked him, as many thousands of dollars of mine as he'd gotten 10% of. Once, in fact, when he'd heard I was broke, he had looked me up and handed me some money and grunted, stick this in your pocket. The issue was the position which his action had put us both into. For Hustler in our sidewalk jungle world, face and honor were important. No hustler could have it known that he'd been hyped, meaning outsmarted or made a fool of. And worse, a hustler could never afford to have it demonstrated that he could be bluffed, that he could be frightened by a threat, that he lacked nerve. West Indian Archie knew that some young hustlers rose in stature in our world when they somehow hoodwinked older hustlers, then put it on the wire for everyone to hear. He believed I was trying that. In turn... I knew he would be protecting his stature by broadcasting all over the wire his threat to me. Because of this code, in my time in Harlem, I'd personally known a dozen hustlers who threatened left town disgraced. Once the wire had it, any retreat by either of us was unthinkable. The wire would be awaiting the report of the showdown. I'd also known of at least another dozen showdowns in which one took the dead-on-arrival ride to the morgue and the other went to prison for manslaughter or the electric chair for murder. Sammy let me hold his thirty-two. My guns were at my apartment. I put the thirty-two in my pocket, with my hand on it, and walked out. I couldn't stay out of sight. I had to show up at all of my usual haunts. I was glad that Reginald was out of town. He might have tried protecting me, and I didn't want him shot in the head by West Indian Archie. It was just about time for me to go and pick up Gene Parks to go downtown to see Billy Holiday at the Onyx Club. So much was swirling in my head. I thought about telephoning her and calling it off, making some excuse. But I knew that running now was the worst thing I could do. So I went on and picked up Jean at her place, who took a taxi down to 52nd Street. Billy, at the microphone, had just finished a number when she saw Jean and me. Her white gown glittered under the spotlight. Her face had that coppery, Indianish look, and her hair was in that trademark ponytail. For her next number, she did the one she knew I always liked so. You don't know what love is until you face each dawn with sleepless eyes 
until you've lost the love you hate to lose. When her set was done, Billy came over to our table. She and Jean, who hadn't seen each other in a long time, hugged each other. Billy sensed something wrong with me. She knew that I was always high, but she knew me well enough to see that something else was wrong, and she asked me in her customary profane language what was the matter with me. And in my own foul vocabulary of those days, I pretended to be without a care, so she let it drop. We had a picture taken by the club photographer that night. The three of us were sitting close together. That was the last time I ever saw Lady Day. She's dead. Dope and heartbreak stopped that heart as big as a barn in that sound and style that no one successfully copies. Lady Day sang with the soul of Negroes from the centuries of sorrow and oppression. What a shame that proud, fine black woman never lived where the true greatness of the black race was appreciated. In the Onyx Club men's room, I sniffed a little packet of cocaine I'd gotten from Sammy. Jean and I, riding back up to Harlem in a cab, decided to have another drink. She had no idea what was happening when she suggested one of my main hangouts, the bar of the Lamar Cherie on the corner of 147th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. I had my gun and the cocaine courage, and I said, okay. By the time we'd had the drink, I was so high that I asked Jean to take a cab on home, and she did. I never have seen Jean again, either. Like a fool, I didn't leave the bar. I stayed there. Sitting like a bigger fool with my back to the door, thinking about West Indian Archie. Since that day, I have never sat with my back to a door, and I never will again. But it's a good thing I was then. I'm positive if I'd seen West Indian Archie come in, I'd have shot to kill. The next thing I knew, West Indian Archie was standing before me, cursing me loud, his gun on me. He was really making his public point, floor showing for the people. He called me foul names, threatened me. Everyone, bartenders, customers, sat or stood as though carved. Drinks in midair. The jukebox in the rear was going. I had never seen West Indian Archie high before. Not a whiskey high. I could tell it was something else. I knew the hustler's characteristic of keying up on dope to do a job. I was thinking, I'm going to kill Archie. I'm just going to wait until he turns around to get the drop on him. I could feel my own thirty-two resting against my ribs where it was tucked under my belt, beneath my coat. West Indian Archie, seeming to read my mind, quit cursing, and his words jarred me. You're thinking you're going to kill me first, Red, but I'm going to give you something to think about. I'm sixty. I'm an old man. I've been to Sing Sing. My life is over. You're a young man. Kill me? You're lost anyway. All you can do is go to prison. I've since thought that West Indian Archie may have been trying to scare me into running to save both his face and his life. It may be that's why he was so high. No one knew that I hadn't killed anyone, but no one who knew me, including myself, would doubt that I'd kill. I can't guess what might have happened, but under the code... If West Indian Archie had gone out the door after having humiliated me as he did, I'd have had to follow him out. We'd have shot it out in the street. But some friends of West Indian Archie moved up alongside him, quietly calling his name. Archie. Archie. And he let them put their hands on him. And they drew him aside. I watched him move him past where I was sitting, glaring at me. They're working them back toward the rear. Then, taking my time, I got down off the stool. I dropped a bill on the bar for the bartender. Without looking back, I went out. I stood outside in full view of the bar with my hand in my pocket for perhaps five minutes. When West Indian Archie didn't come out, I left. It must have been five in the morning when downtown I woke up a white actor I knew who lived in the Howard Hotel on 45th Street off 6th Avenue. I knew I had to stay high. The amount of dope I put into myself within the next several hours sounds inconceivable. I got some opium from that fellow. I took a cab back to my apartment and I smoked it. My gun was ready if I heard a mosquito cough. My telephone rang. 
It was the white lesbian who lived downtown. She wanted me to bring her and her girlfriend $50 worth of reefers. I felt that if I had always done it, I had to do it now. Opium had me drowsy. I had a bottle of Benzedrine tablets in my bathroom. I swallowed some of them to perk up. The two drugs working in me had my head going in opposite directions at the same time. I knocked at the apartment right behind mine. The dealer let me have loose marijuana on credit. He saw I was so high that he even helped me roll it, a hundred sticks. And while we were rolling it, we both smoked some. Now, opium, benzodrine, reefers. I stopped by Sammy's on the way downtown. Sammy was by this time very badly addicted. He seemed hardly to recognize me. Lying in bed, he reached under again and brought out that inevitable shaving mirror on which, for some reason, he always kept his cocaine crystals. He motioned for me to sniff some. I didn't refuse. Going downtown to deliver the reefers, I felt sensations I cannot describe in all those different grooves at the same time. The only word to describe it was timelessness. A day might have seemed to me five minutes, or a half hour might have seemed a week. I can't imagine how I looked when I got to the hotel. When the lesbian and her girlfriend saw me, they helped me to a bed. I fell across it and passed out. That night, when they woke me up, it was half a day beyond West Indian Archie's deadline. I went back uptown. It was on the wire. I could see people who knew me finding business elsewhere. I knew nobody wanted to be caught in a crossfire. But nothing happened. Next day either. I just stayed high. Some raw kid hustling in a bar I had to bust in his mouth. He came back pulling a blade. I would have shot him, but somebody grabbed him. They put him out, cursing that he was going to kill me. Intuition told me to get rid of my gun. I gave a hustler the eye across the bar. I'd no more slipped him the gun from my belt when a cop I'd seen about came in the other door. He had his hand on his gun butt. He knew it was all over the wire. He was certain I'd be armed. He came slowly over toward me, and I knew if I sneezed, he'd blast me down. He said, take your hand out of your pocket, Red, real carefully. I did. Once he saw me empty-handed, we both could relax a little. He motioned for me to walk outside ahead of him, and I did. His partner was waiting on the sidewalk opposite their patrol car, double parked with its radio going. With people stopping, looking, they patted me down there on the sidewalk. What are you looking for? I asked them when they didn't find anything. Red, there's a report you're carrying a gun. I had one, I said, but I threw it in the river. The one that come into the bar said, I think I'd leave town if I were you, Red. I went back to the bar. Saying that I had thrown my gun away had kept them from taking me to my apartment. Things I had there could have gotten me more time than ten guns and could have gotten them a promotion. Everything was building up, closing in on me. I was trapped in so many cross turns. West Indian Archie gunning for me, the Italians who thought I'd stuck up their crap game after me, the scared kid hustler I'd hit, the cops. For four years up to that point, I'd been lucky enough or slick enough to escape jail or even getting arrested or any serious trouble. But I knew that any minute now, something had to give. Sammy had done something for me I've often wished I could have thanked him for. When I heard the car's horn, I was walking on St. Nicholas Avenue, but my ears were hearing a gun. I didn't dream the horn could possibly be for me. Homeboy! I jerked around. I came close to shooting. Shorty! From Boston! I'd scared him nearly to death. Daddy, yo! I couldn't have been happier. Inside the car, he told me Sammy had telephoned about how I was jammed up tight and told him he'd better come and get me. And Shorty did his band's date, then borrowed his piano man's car and burned up the miles to New York. I didn't put up any objections to leaving. Shorty stood watch outside my apartment. I brought out and stuffed into the car's trunk what little stuff I cared to hang on to. Then we hit the highway. Shorty had been without sleep for about 36 hours. He told me afterward that through just about the whole ride back, I talked out of my head. Back in Boston again, even Shorty was amazed and a bit frightened by the animal edge that Malcolm had developed on the streets of Harlem. The hustlers of Roxbury learned quickly that Detroit Red carried a gun and was crazy enough to use it. Malcolm was looking for a new hustle, and this time he settled on house burglary. 
He began recruiting people to join him, starting with Shorty, who was tired of just getting by on his earnings as a musician. Shorty also brought in a friend named Rudy. Sophia, Malcolm's white girlfriend from his earlier days in Boston, also joined. She was married now, but her husband was away most of the time on business. Sophia completed the group when she brought in her younger sister. Malcolm found an apartment in Harvard Square that served as their base of operations. Posing as saleswomen, poll takers, or whatever seemed suitable, the two women would scout wealthy white neighborhoods for the best houses to burglarize. Malcolm and Shorty would do the job, breaking in with lock picks or entering through a window. Rudy drove the getaway car. The ring operated through the winter of 1945, cashing in heavily during the Christmas season. Malcolm continued to boost his courage with heavy doses of drugs. I had gotten to the point, he said, where I was walking on my own coffin. I had put a stolen watch into a jewelry shop to replace a broken crystal. It was about two days later, when I went to pick up the watch, that things fell apart. I had my gun and a shoulder holster under my coat. The loser of the watch, the person from whom it had been stolen by us, I later found, had described the repair that it needed. It was a very expensive watch, that's why I had kept it for myself, and all the jewelers in Boston had been alerted. The jeweler waited until I paid him before he laid the watch on the counter. He gave his signal, and this other fellow suddenly appeared from the back walking toward me. One hand was in his pocket. I knew he was a cop. He said quietly, Step into the back. Just as I started back there, an innocent Negro walked into the shop. I remember later hearing that he had just that day gotten out of the military. The detective, thinking he was with me, turned to him. There I was, wearing my gun and the detective talking to that Negro with his back to me. Today I believe that Allah was with me even then. I didn't try to shoot him, and that saved my life. I remember that his name was Detective Slack. I raised my arm and motioned to him. Here, take my gun. I saw his face when he took it. He was shocked. Because of the sudden appearance of the other Negro, he had never thought about a gun. It really moved him that I hadn't tried to kill him. Then, holding my gun in his hand, he signaled, and out from where they had been concealed walked two other detectives. They'd had me covered. One false move... I'd have been dead. I was going to have a long time in prison to think about that. The detectives grilled me. They didn't beat me. They didn't even put a finger on me. And I knew it was because I hadn't tried to kill the detective. They got my address from some papers they found on me. The girls soon were picked up. Shorty was pulled right off the bandstand that night. The girls also had implicated Rudy. To this day, I have always marveled at how Rudy somehow got the word... I know he must have caught the first thing smoking out of Boston, and he got away. They never got him. The cops found the apartment loaded with evidence, fur coats, some jewelry, other small stuff, plus the tools of our trade, a jimmy, a lockpick, glass cutters, screwdrivers, pencil beam flashlights, false keys, and my small arsenal of guns. The girls got low bail. They were still white, burglars or not. Their worst crime was their involvement with Negroes. But Shorty and I had bail set at $10,000 each, which they knew we were nowhere near able to raise. The social workers worked on us. White women in league with Negroes was their main obsession. The girls weren't so-called tramps or trash. They were well-to-do upper-middle-class whites. That bothered the social workers and the forces of the law more than anything else. How, where, when had I met them? Did we sleep together? Nobody wanted to know anything at all about the robberies. All they could see was that we had taken the white man's women. I just looked at the social workers. Now, what do you think? Even the court clerks and the bailiffs. Nice white girls. God damn niggas. It was the same even from our court-appointed lawyers as we sat down under guard at a table as our hearing assembled. Before the judge entered, I said to one lawyer... We seem to be getting sentenced because of those girls. He got red from the neck up and shuffled his papers. You had no business with white girls. Later, when I learned the full truth about the white man, I reflected many times that the average burglary sentence for a first offender, as we all were, was about two years. But we weren't going to get the average. Not for our crime. 
I want to say before I go on that I have never previously told anyone my sordid past in detail. I haven't done it now to sound as though I might be proud of how bad, how evil I was. But people are always speculating. Why am I as I am? To understand that, of any person, his whole life from birth must be reviewed. All of our experiences fuse into our personality. Everything that ever happened to us is an ingredient. Today, when everything that I do has an urgency, I would not spend one hour in the preparation of a book which had the ambition to perhaps titillate some readers. But I am spending many hours because the full story is the best way that I know to have it seen and understood that I had sunk to the very bottom of the American white man society when soon, now, in prison, I found Allah and the religion of Islam, and it completely transformed my life. I got ten years. The girls got one to five years in the women's reformatory at Framingham, Massachusetts. This was in February 1946. I wasn't quite 21. I had not even started shaving. They took Shorty and me handcuffed together to the Charleston State Prison. I can't remember any of my prison numbers. That seems surprising, even after the dozen years since I have been out of prison, because your number in prison became part of you. You never heard your name, only your number. On all of your clothing, every item was your number, stenciled. It grew stenciled on your brain. Any person who claims to have deep feelings for other human beings should think a long, long time before he votes to have another man kept behind bars, caged. I am not saying there shouldn't be prisons, but there shouldn't be bars. Behind bars, a man never reforms. He will never forget. He never will get completely over the memory of the bars. After he gets out, his mind tries to erase the experience, but he can't. I've talked with numerous former convicts. It has been very interesting to me to find that all of our minds had blotted away many details of the years in prison. But in every case, he will tell you that he can't forget those bars. As a fish, prison slang for a new inmate, at Charleston, I was physically miserable and as evil-tempered as a snake being suddenly without drugs. The cells didn't have running water. The prison had been built in 1805, in Napoleon's day, and was even styled after the Bastille. In the dirty, cramped cell, I could lie on my cot and touch both walls. The toilet was a covered pail. I don't care how strong you are, you can't stand having to smell a whole cell row of defecation. The prison psychologist interviewed me, and he got called every filthy name I could think of, and the prison chaplain got called worse. My first letter, I remember, was from my religious brother Philbert in Detroit, telling me His Holiness Church was going to pray for me. I scrawled a reply I am ashamed to think of today. Ella was my first visitor. I remember seeing her catch herself, then try to smile at me, now when the faded dungarees stenciled with my number. Neither of us could find much to say until I wished she hadn't come at all. The guards with guns watched about fifty convicts and visitors. I have heard scores of new prisoners swearing back in their cells that when free, their first act would be to waylay those visiting room guards. Hatred often focused on them. I first got high in Charleston on nutmeg. My cellmate was among at least a hundred nutmeg men who, for money or cigarettes, bought from kitchen worker inmates penny matchboxes full of stolen nutmeg. I grabbed a box as though it were a pound of heavy drugs. Stirred into a glass of cold water, a penny matchbox full of nutmeg had the kick of three or four reefers. With some money sent by Ella, I was finally able to buy stuff for better highs from guards in prison. I got reefers, nembutol, and benzedrine. Smuggling to prisoners was the guards' sideline. Every prison's inmates know that's how guards make most of their living. I served a total of seven years in prison. Now, when I try to separate that first year plus that I spent in Charleston, it runs all together in a memory of nutmeg and the other semi-drugs of cursing guards, throwing things out of my cells, balking in the lines, dropping my tray in the dining hall, refusing to answer to my number, claiming I forgot it, and things like that. I prefer the solitary that this behavior brought me. I would pace for hours like a caged leopard, viciously cursing aloud to myself. My favorite targets were the Bible and God. 
but there was a legal limit to how much time one could be kept in solitary. Eventually, the men in the cell block had a name for me, Satan, because of my anti-religious attitude. The first man I met in prison who made any positive impression on me whatever was a fellow inmate, Bimby. I met him in 1947 at Charleston. He was a light, kind of red-complexioned Negro, as I was, about my height, and had freckles. Bimby, an old-time burglar, had been in many prisons. In the license plate shop where our gang worked, he operated the machine that stamped out the numbers. I was along the conveyor belt where the numbers were painted. Bimby was the first Negro convict I'd known who didn't respond to, What you know, Daddy? Often, after we had done our day's license plate quota, we would sit around, perhaps fifteen of us, and listen to Bimby. Normally, white prisoners wouldn't think of listening to Negro prisoners' opinions on anything, but guards even would wander over close to hear Bimby on any subject. He would have a cluster of people riveted, often on odd subjects you never would think of. He would prove to us, dipping into the science of human behavior, that the only difference between us and outside people was that we had been caught. He liked to talk about historical events and figures. When he talked about the history of Concord, where I was to be transferred later, he would have thought he was hired by the Chamber of Commerce, and I wasn't the first inmate who had never heard of Thoreau until Bimby expounded on him. Bimby was known as the library's best customer. What fascinated me with him most of all was that he was the first man I had ever seen command total respect with his words. Bimby seldom said much to me. He was gruff to individuals, but I sensed he'd like me. What made me seek his friendship was when I heard him discuss religion. I considered myself beyond atheism. I was Satan. But Bimby put the atheist philosophy in a framework, so to speak, that ended my vicious cursing attacks. My approach sounded so weak alongside his, and he never used a foul word. Out of the blue one day, Bimby told me flatly, as was his way, that I had some brains if I'd used them. I had wanted his friendship, not that kind of advice. I might have cursed another convict, but nobody cursed Bimby. He told me I should take advantage of the prison correspondence courses and the library. When I had finished the eighth grade back in Mason, Michigan, that was the last time I thought of studying anything that didn't have some hustle purpose. And the streets had erased everything I'd ever learned in school. I didn't know a verb from a house. My sister Hilda had written a suggestion that if possible in prison I should study English and penmanship. She had barely been able to read a couple of the picture postcards I had sent her when I was selling reefers on the road. So... Feeling I had some time on my hands, I did begin a correspondence course in English. When the mimeographed listings of available books passed from cell to cell, I would put my number next to titles that appealed to me which weren't already taken. Through the correspondence exercises and lessons, some of the mechanics of grammar gradually began to come back to me. After about a year, I guess I could write a decent and legible letter. About then, too, influenced by having heard Bimby often explain word derivations, I quietly started another correspondence course, in Latin. Under Bimby's tutelage, too, I had gotten myself some little cell block swindles going. For packs of cigarettes, I beat just about anyone at Domino's. I always had several cartons of cigarettes in my cell. They were, in prison, nearly as valuable a medium of exchange as money. I booked cigarette and money bets on fights and ball games. I'll never forget the prison sensation created that day in April 1947 when Jackie Robinson was brought up to play with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Jackie Robinson had then his most fanatic fan in me. When he played, my ear was glued to the radio, and no game ended without my refiguring his average up through his last turn at bat. One day in 1948... After I had transferred to Concord Prison, my brother Philbert, who was forever joining something, wrote me this time that he had discovered the natural religion for the black man. He belonged now, he said, to something called the Nation of Islam. He said I should pray to Allah for deliverance. I wrote Philbert a letter which, although in improved English, was worse than my earlier reply to his news that I was being prayed for by His Holiness Church. 
When a letter from Reginald arrived, I never dreamed of associating the two letters, although I knew that Reginald had been spending a lot of time with Wilfred, Hilda, and Filbert in Detroit. Reginald's letter was newsy and also contained this instruction. Malcolm, don't eat any more pork and don't smoke any more cigarettes. I'll show you how to get out of prison. My automatic response was to think he had come upon some way I could work a hype on the penal authorities. I went to sleep and woke up trying to figure out what kind of hype it could be. Something psychological, such as my act with the New York draft board? Could I, after going without pork and smoking no cigarettes for a while, claim some physical trouble that could bring about my release? Get out of prison. The words hung in the air around me. I wanted out so badly. I wanted in the worst way to consult with Bimby about it. But something big, instinct, said, you spilled to nobody. Quitting cigarettes wasn't going to be too difficult. I'd been conditioned by days in solitary without cigarettes. Whatever this chance was, I wasn't going to fluff it. After I read that letter, I finished the pack I then had opened. I haven't smoked another cigarette to this day since 1948. It was about three or four days later when pork was served for the noon meal. I wasn't even thinking about pork when I took my seat at the long table. Sit, grab, gobble, stand, file out. That was the Emily Post in prison eaten. When the meal platter was passed to me, I didn't even know what the meat was. Usually you couldn't tell anyway, but it was suddenly as though don't eat any more pork flashed on a screen before me. I hesitated with the platter in midair, then I passed it along to the inmate waiting next to me. He began serving himself. Abruptly, he stopped. I remember him turning, looking surprised at me. I said to him, I don't eat pork. The platter then kept on down the table. It was the funniest thing, the reaction, and the way that it spread. In prison, where so little breaks the monotonous routine, the smallest thing causes a commotion of talk. It was being mentioned all over the cell block by night that Satan didn't eat pork. It made me proud in some odd way. One of the universal images of the Negro in prison and out was that he couldn't do without pork. It made me feel good to see that my not eating it had especially startled the white convicts. Later I would learn, when I had read and studied Islam a good deal, that unconsciously my first pre-Islamic submission had been manifested. I had experienced for the first time the Muslim teaching, if you will take one step toward Allah, Allah will take two steps toward you. My brothers and sisters in Detroit and Chicago had all become converted to what they were being taught was the natural religion for the black man of which Filbert had written to me. They all prayed for me to become converted while I was in prison. But after Filbert reported my vicious reply, they discussed what was the best thing to do. They had decided that Reginald, the latest convert, the one to whom I felt closest, would best know how to approach me, since he knew me so well in the street life. Independently of all this, my sister Ella had been steadily working to get me transferred to the Norfolk, Massachusetts prison colony, which was an experimental rehabilitation jail. In other prisons, convicts often said that if you had the right money or connections, you could get transferred to this colony whose penal policy sounded almost too good to be true. Somehow, Ella's efforts in my behalf were successful in late 1948, and I was transferred to Norfolk. The colony was comparatively a heaven in many respects. It had flushing toilets. There were no bars, only walls, and within the walls you had far more freedom. There was plenty of fresh air to breathe that was not in a city. There were 24 house units, 50 men living in each unit, if memory serves me correctly. This would mean that the colony had a total of around 1,200 inmates. Each house had three floors, and greatest blessing of all, each inmate had his own room. About 15 or 20 percent of the inmates were Negroes, distributed about five to nine Negroes in each house. Norfolk Prison Colony represented the most enlightened form of prison that I have ever heard of. In place of the atmosphere of malicious gossip, perversion, grafting, hateful guards, there was more relative culture, as culture is interpreted in prisons. A high percentage of the Norfolk prison colony inmates 
went in for intellectual things, group discussions, debates and such. Instructors came from Harvard, Boston University, and other educational institutions in the area. The visiting rules, far more lenient than other prisons, permitted visitors almost every day and allowed them to stay two hours. You had your choice of sitting alongside your visitor or facing each other. Norfolk Prison Colony's library was one of its outstanding features. A millionaire named Parkhurst had willed his library there. He had probably been interested in the rehabilitation program. History and religions were his special interests. Thousands of his books were on the shelves, and in the back were boxes and crates full, for which there wasn't space on the shelves. At Norfolk, we could actually go into the library, with permission, walk up and down the shelves, pick books. There were hundreds of old volumes, some of them probably quite rare. I read aimlessly until I learned to read selectively with a purpose. I hadn't heard from Reginald in a good while after I got to Norfolk Prison Colony. But I'd come in there not smoking cigarettes or eating pork when it was served. That caused a bit of eyebrow raising. Then a letter from Reginald telling me when he was coming to see me. By the time he came, I was really keyed up to hear the hype he was going to explain. Reginald knew how my street hustler mind operated. That's why his approach was so effective. He had always dressed well, and now, when he came to visit, was carefully groomed. I was aching with wanting the no pork and cigarettes riddle answered. But he talked about the family, what was happening in Detroit, Harlem, the last time he was there. I have never pushed anyone to tell me anything before he is ready. The offhand way Reginald talked and acted made me know that something big was coming. He said finally, as though it had just happened to come into his mind, Malcolm, if a man knew everything imaginable that there is to know, who would he be? Back in Harlem, he'd often liked to get at something through this kind of indirection. It had often irritated me because my way had always been direct. I looked at him. Well, uh, he would have to be some kind of a god. Reginald said, There's a man who knows everything. I asked, Who is that? God is a man, Reginald said. His real name is Allah. Allah. That word came back to me from Filbert's letter. It was my first hint of any connection. But Reginald went on. He said that God had 360 degrees of knowledge. He said that 360 degrees represented the sum total of knowledge. To say I was confused is an understatement. I don't have to remind you of the background against which I sat hearing my brother Reginald talk like this. I just listened. Knowing he was taking his time, putting me on to something. And if somebody's trying to put you on to something, you need to listen. The devil had only 33 degrees of knowledge, known as masonry, Reginald said. I can so specifically remember the exact phrases since, later, I was going to teach them so many times to others. The devil uses his masonry to rule other people. He told me that this god had come to America and that he had made himself known to a man named Elijah, a black man, just like us. This god had let... Elijah no, Reginald said, that the devil's time was up. I didn't know what to think. I just listened. The devil is also a man, Reginald said. What do you mean? With a slight movement of his head, Reginald indicated some white inmates and their visitors talking, as we were, across the room. Them, he said. The white man is the devil. He told me that all whites knew they were devils, especially Masons. I never will forget. My mind was involuntarily flashing across the entire spectrum of white people I had ever known. I said, without any exceptions, without any exceptions. After Reginald left, I thought, I thought, thought I couldn't make of it head or tail or middle. 
the white people I had known marched before my mind's eye from the start of my life. The state white people always in our house after the other whites I didn't know had killed my father. The white people who kept calling my mother crazy to her face and before me and my brothers and sisters until she finally was taken off by white people to the Kalamazoo Asylum. The white judge and others who had split up the children. White youngsters I was in school there with and the teachers. The one who told me in the eighth grade to be a carpenter because thinking of being a lawyer was foolish for a Negro. My head swam with the parading faces of white people. The ones in Boston and the white-only dances at the Roseland Ballroom where I shined their shoes, at the Parker House where I took their dirty plates back to the kitchen, the railroad crewmen and passengers, Sophia, the whites in New York City, the cops, the white criminals I dealt with, the whites who piled into the Negro speakeasies for a taste of Negro soul, the white women who wanted Negro men, the men I'd steered to the black specialty sex they wanted, the fence back in Boston and his ex-con representative, Boston cops, the social workers, the Middlesex County court people, the judge who gave me ten years, the prisoners I'd known, the guards and the officials. Reginald, when he came to visit me again in a few days, could gauge from my attitude the effect that his talking had had upon me. He seemed very pleased. And very seriously, he talked for two solid hours about the devil white man and the brainwashed black man. When Reginald left, he left me rocking with some of the first serious thoughts I had ever had in my life. That the white man was fast losing his power to oppress and exploit the dark world. That the dark world was starting to rise to rule the world again as it had before. That the white man's world was on the way down. It was on the way out. You don't even know who you are, Reginald had said. You don't even know the white devil has hidden it from you. That you are of a race of people of ancient civilizations and riches and gold and kings. You don't even know your true family name. You wouldn't recognize your true language if you heard it. You have been cut off by the devil white man from all true knowledge of your own kind. You have been a victim of the evil of the devil white man ever since he murdered and raped and stole from you your native land and the seeds of your forefathers. I began to receive at least two letters a day from my brothers and sisters in Detroit. My oldest brother Wilford wrote, and his first wife, Bertha, the mother of his two children. Since her death, Wilford has met and married his present wife, Ruth. Philbert wrote, and my sister Hilda. And Reginald visited, staying in Boston a while before he went back to Detroit, where he had been the most recent of them to be converted. They were all Muslims, followers of a man they described to me as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a small, gentle man, whom they sometimes referred to as the Messenger of Allah. He was, they said, a black man like us. He had been born in America on a farm in Georgia. He had moved with his family to Detroit and there had met a Mr. Wallace D. Fard, who he claimed was God in person. Mr. Wallace D. Fard had given to Elijah Muhammad Allah's message for the black people who were the lost found nation of Islam here in the wilderness of North America. All of them urged me to accept the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Reginald explained that pork was not eaten by those who worshipped in the religion of Islam, and not smoking cigarettes was a rule of the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because they did not take injurious things such as narcotics, tobacco, or liquor into their bodies. Over and over I read and heard the key to a Muslim is submission, the attunement of one toward Allah and what they term the true knowledge of the black man that was possessed by the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was given shape for me in the lengthy letters, sometimes containing printed literature. The true knowledge, reconstructed much more briefly than I received it, was that history had been whitened in the white man's history books and that the black man had been brainwashed for hundreds of years. Original man was black, in the continent called Africa where the human race had emerged on the planet Earth. The black man, the original man, built great empires and civilizations and cultures while the white man was still living on all fours in caves. The devil white man, down through history, out of his devilish nature, had pillaged, 
murdered, raped, and exploited every race of man, not white. Human history's greatest crime was the traffic in black flesh when the devil white man went to Africa and murdered and kidnapped to bring to the West in chains, in slave ships, millions of black men, women, and children who were worked and beaten and tortured as slaves. The devil white man cut these black people off from all knowledge of their own kind and cut them off from any knowledge of their own language, religion, and past culture until the black man in America was the earth's only race of people who had absolutely no knowledge of his true identity. In one generation, the black slave women in America had been raped by the slave master white man until there had begun to emerge a homemade, handmade, brainwashed race that was no longer even of its true color, that no longer even knew its true family names. The slave master forced his family name upon this rape-mixed race, which the slave master began to call the Negro. This Negro was taught of his native Africa that it was peopled by heathen, black savages swinging like monkeys from trees. This Negro accepted this along with every other teaching of the slave master that was designed to make him accept and obey and worship the white man. And where the religion of every other people on earth taught its believers of a God with whom they could identify, a God who at least looked like one of their own kind, the slave master injected his Christian religion into this Negro. This Negro was taught to worship an alien God having the same blonde hair, pale skin, and blue eyes as the slave master. This religion taught the Negro that black was a curse. It taught him to hate everything black, including himself. It taught him that everything white was good, to be admired, respected, and loved. It brainwashed this Negro to think he was superior if his complexion showed more of the white pollution of the slave master. This white man's Christian religion further deceived and brainwashed this Negro to always turn the other cheek and grin and scrape and bow and be humble and to sing and pray and to take whatever was dished out by the devilish white man, and to look for his pie in the sky, and for his heaven in the hereafter, while right here on earth the slave master white man enjoyed his heaven. Many a time I have looked back trying to assess, just for myself, my first reactions to all this. Every instinct of the ghetto jungle streets, every hustling fox and criminal wolf instinct in me, which would have scoffed at and rejected anything else, was struck numb. It was as though all of that life merely was back there, without any remaining effect or influence. I remember how sometime later, reading the Bible in the Norfolk Prison Colony Library, I came upon, then I read, over and over, how Paul, on the road to Damascus, upon hearing the voice of Christ, was so smitten that he was knocked off his horse in a daze. I do not now, and I did not then, liken myself to Paul, but I do understand his experience. Reginald left Boston and went back to Detroit. I would sit in my room and stare. At the dining room table I would hardly eat, only drink the water. I nearly starved. Fellow inmates concerned and guards apprehensive asked what was wrong with me. It was suggested that I visit the doctor, and I didn't. The doctor advised, visited me. I don't know what his diagnosis was, probably that I was working on some act. I was going through the hardest thing, also the greatest thing for any human being to do, to accept that which is already within you and around you. At the urging of his brothers and sisters, Malcolm wrote a letter to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. His penmanship, his spelling, and his grammar were poor. He scratched out an apology for his ineptitude. To his amazement, Elijah Muhammad wrote back. That letter's effect on Malcolm 
was profound in the fullest sense of the word. He began to write daily to Elijah Muhammad, to his siblings, even to Sammy the Pimp and his other former running mates in Harlem. The more he wrote, the more he felt frustrated by his limitations. To improve his vocabulary and his penmanship, he copied an entire dictionary longhand, and then he began to read history, philosophy, linguistics, anthropology. He consumed knowledge the way he had once consumed drugs. After the inmates' lights were turned out at 10 p.m., Malcolm would continue reading by the dim glow of a small bulb in the corridor, often until dawn. And everywhere, in the books, in the letters from his family, in conversations with Reginald when he came to visit, Malcolm found evidence that supported the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In prison, Malcolm learned to pray. He became a Muslim. He began participating in weekly formal debates held at the Norfolk prison, and he also began recruiting other black inmates for the Nation of Islam. During the spring of 1952, I joyously wrote Elijah Muhammad and my family that the Massachusetts State Parole Board had voted that I should be released. But still a few months were taken up with the red tape delay of paperwork that went back and forth, arranging for my parole release in the custody of my oldest brother, Wilford, in Detroit, who now managed a furniture store. Wilford got the Jew who owned the store to sign a promise that upon release I would be given immediate employment. It was in August when they gave me a lecture a cheap little Abner suit, and a small amount of money, and I walked out of the gate. I never looked back, but that doesn't make me any different from a million inmates who have left a prison behind them. The first stop I made was at a Turkish bath. I got some of that physical feeling of prison taint steamed off me. Ella, with whom I stayed only overnight, had agreed that it would be best for me to start again in Detroit, the police in a new city wouldn't have it in for me. That was Ella's consideration, not the Muslims, for whom Ella had no use. Both Hilda and Reginald had tried to work on Ella, but Ella, with her strong will, didn't go for it at all. She told me that she felt anyone could be whatever he wanted to be, Holy Roller, Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever it was, but she wasn't going to become any Muslim. Hilda the next morning gave me some money to put in my pocket. Before I left, I went out, bought three things I remember well. I bought a better-looking pair of eyeglasses than the pair the prison had issued to me, and I bought a suitcase and a wristwatch. I have thought since that without fully knowing it, I was preparing for what my life was about to become, because those are the three things I've always used more than anything else. My eyeglasses correct the astigmatism that I got from all the reading in prison. I travel so much that my wife keeps alternate suitcases packed so that, when necessary, I can just grab one. And you won't find anybody more time-conscious than I am. I live by my watch, keeping appointments. Even when I'm using my car, I drive by my watch, not my speedometer. Time is more important to me than distance. I caught a bus to Detroit. The furniture store that my brother Wilford managed was right in the black ghetto of Detroit. I'd better not name the store if I'm going to tell the way they rob Negroes. Wilford introduced me to the Jews who owned the store, and, as agreed, I was put to work as a salesman. Nothing down advertisements drew poor Negroes into that store like flypaper. In all my years in the streets, I'd been looking at the exploitation that for the first time I really saw and understood— now I watched brothers entwining themselves in the economic clutches of the white man who went home every night with another bag of money drained out of the ghetto. I saw the money that, instead of helping the black man, was going to help enrich these white merchants who usually lived in an exclusive area where a black man had better not get caught unless he worked there for somebody white. Wilfred invited me to share his home, and gratefully I accepted. The warmth of a home and a family was a healing change from the prison cage for me. It would deeply move almost any newly freed convict, I think. But especially this Muslim home's atmosphere sent me often to my knees to praise Allah. My family's letters while I was in prison had included a description of the Muslim home routine, but to truly appreciate it, one had to be a part of the routine. 
each act, and the significance of that act was gently, patiently explained to me by my brother Wilfred. There was none of the morning confusion that exists in most homes. Wilfred, the father, the family protector and provider, was the first to rise. The father prepares the way for his family, he said. He, then I, performed the morning ablutions. Next came Wilfred's wife, Ruth, and then their children, so that orderliness prevailed in the use of the bathroom. In the name of Allah, I perform the ablution, the Muslim said aloud before washing first the right hand and then the left hand. The teeth were thoroughly brushed, followed by three rinses out of the mouth. The nostrils also were rinsed out thrice. A shower then completed the whole body's purification in readiness for prayer. Each family member, even children upon meeting each other for that new day's first time, greeted softly and pleasantly, Assalam alaikum, the Arabic for peace be unto you, while alaikum salam, and unto you be peace, was the other's reply. Over and over again the Muslim said in his own mind, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. The prayer rug was spread by Wilfred while the rest of the family purified themselves. It was explained to me that a Muslim family prayed with the sun near the horizon. If that time was missed, the prayer had to be deferred until the sun was beyond the horizon. Muslims are not sun worshippers. We pray facing the east to be in unity with the rest of our 725 million brothers and sisters in the entire Muslim world. All the family, in robes, lined up facing east. In unison, we stepped from our slippers to stand on the prayer rug. Today, I say with my family in Arabic tongue the prayer which I first learned in English. I perform the morning prayer to Allah, the Most High. Allah is the greatest. Glory to thee, O Allah. Thine is the praise. Blessed is thy name, and exalted is thy majesty. I bear witness that nothing deserves to be served or worshipped, besides thee. No solid food, only juice and coffee, was taken for our breakfasts. Wilfred and I went off to work. There, at noon and again at around three in the afternoon, unnoticed by the others in the furniture store, we would rinse our hands, faces, and mouths, and softly meditate. Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays were the meeting days of the relatively small Detroit Temple No. 1. Near the temple, which was actually a storefront, were three hog-slaughtering pens. The squealing of hogs being slaughtered filtered into our Wednesday and Friday meetings. I'm describing the condition that we Muslims were in back in the early 1950s. The address of Temple No. 1 was 1470 Frederick Street, I think, the first temple to be formed back in 1931 by Master W.D. Fard was formed in Detroit, Michigan. I never had seen any Christian believing Negroes conduct themselves like the Muslims, the individuals, and the families alike. The men were quietly, tastefully dressed. The women wore ankle-length gowns, no makeup, and scarves covered their heads. The neat children were mannerly not only to adults, but to other children as well. I had never dreamed of anything like that atmosphere among black people who had learned to be proud they were black, who had learned to love other black people instead of being jealous and suspicious. I thrilled at how we Muslim men used both hands to grasp a black brother's both hands, voicing and smiling our happiness to meet him again. The Muslim sisters, both married and single, were given an honor and respect that I had never seen black men give to their women, and it felt wonderful to me. The salutations which we all exchanged were warm, filled with mutual respect and dignity. Brother, sister, ma'am, sir, even children speaking to other children used these terms. Beautiful. Lemuel Hassan then was the minister at Temple No. 1. Assalamu he greeted us. Wassalamu we returned. Minister Lemuel stood before us near a blackboard. The blackboard had fixed upon it in permanent paint on one side the United States flag and under it the words slavery, suffering, and death. Then the word Christianity alongside the sign of the cross. Beneath the cross was a painting of a black man hanged from a tree. On the other side was painted what we were taught was the Muslim flag, the crescent and star on a red background with the words Islam, freedom, justice, equality. And beneath that, 
which one will survive the war of Armageddon. For more than an hour, Minister Lemuel lectured about Elijah Muhammad's teachings. I sat rapidly absorbing Minister Lemuel's every syllable and gesture. I thought it was outrageous that our small temple still had some empty seats. I complained to my brother Wilford that there should be no empty seats, with the surrounding streets full of brainwashed black brothers and sisters, drinking, cursing, fighting, dancing, carousing, and using dope. The very things that Mr. Muhammad taught were helping the black man to stay under the heel of the white man here in America. From what I could gather, the recruitment attitude at the temple seemed to me to amount to a self-defeating waiting view, an assumption that Allah would bring us more Muslims. I felt that Allah would be more inclined to help those who help themselves. I had lived for years in ghetto streets. I knew the Negroes in those streets. Harlem or Detroit were no different. I said I disagreed, that I thought we should go out into the streets and get more Muslims into the fold. All of my life, as you know, I had been an activist. I had been impatient. My brother Wilford counseled me to keep patience, and for me to be patient was made easier by the fact that I could anticipate soon seeing and perhaps meeting the man who was called the messenger, Elijah Muhammad himself. Today, I have appointments with world-famous personages, including some heads of nations, but I looked forward to the Sunday before Labor Day in 1952 with an eagerness never since duplicated. Detroit Temple No. 1 Muslims were going in a motor caravan, I think about ten automobiles, to visit Chicago Temple No. 2 to hear Elijah Muhammad. Not since childhood had I been so excited as when I drove in Wilford's car. At great Muslim rallies since then I have seen and heard and felt 10,000 black people applauding and cheering. But on that Sunday afternoon when our two little temples assembled, perhaps only 200 Muslims, the Chicagoans welcoming and greeting us Detroiters, I experienced tinglings up my spine as I've never had since. I was totally unprepared for the messenger Elijah Muhammad's physical impact upon my emotions. From the rear of the temple number two, he came toward the platform. The small, sensitive, gentle, brown face that I had studied on photographs until I, I had dreamed about it, was fixed straight ahead as the messenger strode, encircled by the marching, strapping fruit of Islam guards. The messenger, compared to them, seemed fragile, almost tiny. He and the fruit of Islam were dressed in dark suits, white shirts, and bow ties. The messenger wore a gold-embroidered fez. I stared at the great man who had taken the time to write to me when I was a convict whom he knew nothing about. He was the man whom I had been told had spent years of his life in suffering and sacrifice to lead us, the black people, because he loved us so much. And then, hearing his voice, I sat leaning forward, riveted upon his words. I tried to reconstruct what Elijah Muhammad said from having since heard him speak hundreds of times. I have not stopped one day for the past 21 years. I have been standing preaching to you throughout those past 21 years while I was free and even while I was in bondage. I spent three and one half years in the federal penitentiary and also over a year in the city jail for teaching this truth. I was also deprived of a father's love for his family for seven long years while I was running from hypocrites and other enemies of this word and revelation of God, which will give life to you and put you on the same level with all other civilized and independent nations and peoples of this planet Earth. Elijah Muhammad spoke of how in this wilderness of North America, for centuries, the blue-eyed devil white man had brainwashed the so-called Negro. He told us how, as one result, the black man in America was mentally, morally, and spiritually dead. Elijah Muhammad spoke of how the black man was original man, who had been kidnapped from his homeland and stripped of his language, his culture, his family structure, his family name, until the black man in America did not even realize who he was. He told us and showed us how his teachings of the true knowledge of ourselves would lift up the black man from the bottom of the white man society and place the black man where he had begun, at the top of civilization. Concluding, pausing for breath, he called my name. It was like an electric shock. Not looking at me directly, 
he asked me to stand. He told him that I was just out of prison. He said how strong I had been while in prison. Every day, he said, for years, Brother Malcolm has written a letter from prison to me, and I have written to him as often as I could. Standing there, feeling the eyes of the two hundred Muslims upon me, I heard him make a parable about me. When God bragged about how faithful Job was, said Elijah Muhammad, the devil said, only God's hedge around Job kept Job so faithful. Remove that protective hedge, the devil told God, and I will make Job curse you to your face. The devil could claim that, hedged in prison, I had just used Islam, Mr. Muhammad said. But the devil would say that now, out of prison, I would return to my drinking, smoking, dope, and life of crime. Well, now, our good brother Malcolm's hedge is removed, and we will see how he does, Mr. Muhammad said. I believe that he is going to remain faithful. And Allah bless me to remain true, firm, and strong in my faith in Islam, despite many severe trials to my faith. And even when events produced a crisis between Elijah Muhammad and me, I told him at the beginning of the crisis, with all the sincerity I had in me, that I still believed in him more strongly than he believed in himself. Mr. Muhammad and I are not together today only because of envy and jealousy. I had more faith in Elijah Muhammad than I could ever have in any other man upon this earth. That Sunday, after the meeting, he invited our entire family group and Minister Lemuel Hassan to be his guests for dinner that evening at his new home. Mr. Muhammad said that his children and his followers had insisted that he move into this larger, better 18-room house in Chicago at 4847 Woodlawn Avenue. They had just moved in that week, I believe. When we arrived, Mr. Muhammad showed us where he had just been painting, I had to restrain my impulse to run and bring a chair for the messenger of Allah. Instead, as I had heard he would do, he was worrying about my comfort. We had hoped to hear his wisdom during the dinner, but instead he encouraged us to talk. I sat thinking of how our Detroit temple more or less just sat and awaited Allah to bring converts. And beyond that, of the millions of black people all over America who never had heard of the teachings that would stir and awake and resurrect the black man. And there, at Mr. Muhammad's table, I found my tongue. I have always been one to speak my mind. During a conversational lull, I asked Mr. Muhammad how many Muslims were supposed to be in our temple number one in Detroit. He said, there are supposed to be thousands. Yes, sir, I said. Sir, what is your opinion of the best way of getting thousands there? Go after the young people, he said. Once you get them, the older ones will follow through shame. I made up my mind that we were going to follow that advice. Back in Detroit, I talked with my brother Wilford. I offered my services to our temple's minister, Lemuel Hassan. He shared my determination that we should apply Mr. Muhammad's formula in a recruitment drive. Beginning that day, every evening, straight from work at the furniture store, I went doing what we Muslims later came to call fishing. I knew the thinking and the language of the ghetto streets. My man, let me pull your coat to something. My application had, of course, been made, and during this time I received from Chicago my ex. The Muslim's ex symbolized the true African family name that he never could know. For me... My ex replaced the white slave master name of Little, which some blue-eyed devil named Little had imposed upon my paternal forebears. The receipt of my ex meant that forever after, in the nation of Islam, I would be known as Malcolm X. Mr. Muhammad taught that we would keep this ex until God himself returned and gave us a holy name from his own mouth. Recruit as I would in the Detroit ghetto bars, in the pool rooms, and on the corners, I found my poor, ignorant, brainwashed black brothers mostly too deaf, dumb, and blind, mentally, morally, and spiritually, to respond. It angered me that only now and then would one display even a little curiosity about the teachings that would resurrect the black man. 
These few I would almost beg to visit Temple Number One at our next meeting. But then, not half of those who agreed to come would actually show up. Gradually, enough were made interested, though, that each month a few more automobiles lengthen our caravans to Temple Two in Chicago. But even after seeing and hearing Elijah Muhammad in person, only a few of the interested visitors would apply by formal letter to Mr. Muhammad to be accepted for the Nation of Islam membership. With a few months of plugging away, however, our storefront Temple One about tripled its membership. And that so deeply pleased Mr. Muhammad that he paid us the honor of a personal visit. Mr. Muhammad gave me warm praise when Minister Lemuel Hassan told how hard I had labored in the cause of Islam. Our caravans grew. I remember with what pride we'd led 25 automobiles to Chicago. And each time we went, we were honored with dinner at the home of Elijah Muhammad. He was interested in my potential. I could tell from things he would say, and I worshipped him. At the urging of Minister Lemuel Hassan, Malcolm X addressed the Temple One followers. His passion and his obvious talent for public speaking led to more invitations to speak. As often as he could, Malcolm traveled to Chicago to hear the words of the messenger Elijah Muhammad. The Nation of Islam's leader had taken a personal interest in his young disciple and invited him often to his home, where he held Malcolm X spellbound with stories of his struggle to have his message heard. The Nation needed ministers to spread the word. Elijah Muhammad saw the potential in Malcolm X, and soon the visits to Chicago became training sessions. Never in prison had I studied and absorbed so intensely as I did now under Mr. Muhammad's guidance. I was immersed in the worship rituals, in what he taught us were the true natures of men and women, the organizational and administrative procedures, the real meanings and the interrelated meanings and uses of the Bible and the Koran. I went to bed every night ever more awed. If not Allah, who else could have put such wisdom into that little humble lamb of a man from the Georgia fourth grade and sawmills and cotton patches? The lamb of a man analogy I drew for myself from the prophecy in the book of Revelations of a symbolic lamb with a two-edged sword in its mouth. Mr. Muhammad's two-edged sword was his teachings, which cut back and forth to free the black man's mind from the white man. My adoration of Mr. Muhammad grew in the sense of the Latin root word adorare. It, it means much more than our adoration or adore. It means that my worship of him was so awesome that he was the first man whom I ever feared. Not fear such as of a man with a gun, but the fear such as one has of the power of the sun. Mr. Muhammad, when he felt me able, permitted me to go to Boston. Brother Lloyd X lived there. He invited people whom he had gotten interested in Islam to hear me in his living room. God has given Mr. Muhammad some sharp truth, I told him. It is like a two-edged sword. It cuts into you. It causes you great pain. But if you can take the truth, it will cure you and save you from what otherwise would be certain death. And then I wouldn't waste any time to start opening their eyes about the devil white man. I know you don't realize the enormity, the horrors of the so-called Christian white man's crime. Not even in the Bible is there such a crime. God, in his wrath, struck down with fire the perpetrators of lesser crimes. One hundred million of us black people, your grandparents, mine, murdered by this white man. To get 15 million of us here to make us slaves on the way he murdered one hundred million. I wish it was possible for me to show you the sea bottom in those days, the black bodies, the blood, the bones broken by boots and clubs, the pregnant black women who were thrown overboard if they got too sick, thrown overboard to the sharks that had learned that following these slave ships was the way to grow fat. Why the white man's raping of the black race's woman began right on those slave ships. The blue-eyed devil could not even wait until he got them here 
our brothers and sisters, civilized mankind has never known such an orgy of greed and lust and murder. The dramatization of slavery never failed intensely to arouse Negroes hearing its horrors spelled out for the first time. It's unbelievable how many black men and women have let the white man fool them into holding an almost romantic idea of what slave days were like. And once I had them fired up with slavery, I would shift the scene to themselves. I want you, when you leave this room, to start to see all this whenever you see the devil white man. Oh, yes, he's a devil. I just want you to start watching him in his places where he doesn't want you around. Watch him reveling in his preciousness and his exclusiveness and his vanity while he continues to subjugate you and me. Every time you see a white man, think about the devil you're seeing. Think of how it was on your slave four parents' bloody, sweaty backs that he built this empire that's today the richest of all nations, where his evil and his greed caused him to be hated around the world. Every meeting, the people who had been there before returned bringing friends. None of them ever had heard the raps taken off the white man. I can't remember any black man in those living room audiences in Brother Lloyd X's home at 5 Wellington Street who didn't stand up immediately when I asked after each lecture, will all stand who believe what you have heard. And each Sunday night, some of them stood while I could see others not quite ready when I asked, how many of you want to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Enough had stood up after about three months that we were able to open a little temple. I remember with what pleasure we rented some folding chairs. I was beside myself with joy when I could report to Mr. Muhammad a new temple address. It was when we got this little mosque that my sister Ella first began to come to hear me. She sat staring as though she couldn't believe it was me. Ella never moved, even when I had only asked all who believed what they had heard to stand up. She contributed when our collection was held. It didn't bother or challenge me at all about Ella. I never even thought about converting her, as tough-minded and cautious about joining anything as I personally knew her to be. I wouldn't have expected anyone short of Allah himself to have been able to convert Ella. As Temple Eleven's minister, I served only briefly because as soon as I got it organized by March 1954, I left it in charge of Minister Ulysses X and the messenger moved me on to Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love black people reacted even faster to the truth about the white man than the Bostonians had, and Philadelphia's Temple 12 was established by the end of May. It had taken a little under three months. The next month, because of those Boston and Philadelphia successes, Mr. Muhammad appointed me to be the minister of Temple 7 in vital New York City. I can't start to describe for you my welter of emotions, for Mr. Muhammad's teachings really to resurrect American black people Islam obviously had to grow, to grow very big, and no way in America was such a single temple potential available as in New York's five boroughs. They contained over a million black people. Organizing, recruiting, buttonholing brothers and sisters on the street, speaking to rapt audiences, Malcolm X brought scores of new members to New York's Temple 7. He also established new temples in Hartford and Atlanta, and spurred more growth in the Philadelphia, Boston, and Springfield, Massachusetts temples. He spent so much time traveling that the nation provided him with a car. His life became one of constant motion, lecturing, teaching, spreading the word of Islam. He brought thousands of new members into the fold, and his words touched many thousands more. He was a dynamo, charismatic, dedicated, articulate, and as noted by increasing numbers of Muslim sisters, single. I had always been very careful to stay completely clear of any personal closeness with any of the Muslim sisters. My total commitment to Islam demanded having no interest, especially I felt no women. In almost every temple, at least one single sister had let out some broad hint that she thought I needed a wife, so I always made it clear that marriage had no interest for me whatsoever. I was too busy. Every month when I went to Chicago, 
I would find that some sister had written complaining to Mr. Muhammad that I had talked so hard against women when I taught our special classes about the different natures of the two sexes. Now, Islam has very strict laws and teachings about women, the core of them being that the true nature of a man is to be strong and a woman's true nature is to be weak. And while a man must at all times respect his woman, at the same time he needs to understand that he must control her if he expects to get her respect. But in those days, I had my own personal reasons. I wouldn't have considered it possible for me to love any woman. I had too much experience that women were only tricky, deceitful, untrustworthy flesh. I had seen too many men ruined or at least tied down or in some other way messed up by women. Women talk too much. To tell a woman not to talk was like telling Jesse James not to carry a gun or telling a hen not to cackle. But can you imagine Jesse James without a gun or a hen that didn't cackle? And for anyone in any kind of leadership position such as I was, the worst thing in the world that he could have was the wrong woman. Even Samson, the world's strongest man, was destroyed by the woman who slept in his arms. She was the one whose words hurt him. Anyway, it had been ten years since I thought anything about any mistress, I guess, and as a minister now, I was thinking even less about getting any wife. And Mr. Muhammad himself encouraged me to stay single. This sister, well, in... 1956, she joined Temple 7. I just noticed her, not with the slightest interest, you understand. For about the next year, I just noticed her. You know, she never would have dreamed I was even thinking about her. In fact, probably you couldn't have convinced her I even knew her name. It was Sister Betty X. She was tall, brown skin, darker than I was, and she had brown eyes. I knew she was a native of Detroit and that she had been a student at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, an education major. She was in New York in one of the big hospitals' school of nursing. She lectured to the Muslim girls in women's classes on hygiene and medical facts. One day, I thought it would help the women's classes if I took her just because she happened to be an instructor to the Museum of Natural History. I wanted to show her some museum displays having to do with the tree of evolution that would help her in her lectures. I could show her proofs of Mr. Muhammad's teachings of such things as that the filthy pig is only a large rodent. The pig is a graft between a rat, a cat, and a dog, Mr. Muhammad taught us. When I mentioned my idea to Sister Betty X, I made it very clear that it was just to help her lectures to her sisters. I had even convinced myself that this was the only reason. Then, by the time of the afternoon, I said we would go. Well, I telephoned her. I told her I had to cancel the trip, that something important had come up. She said, Well, you sure waited long enough to tell me, Brother Minister, and I was just ready to walk out the door. So I told her, Well, all right, all right, just come on then. I, I'd make it somehow. But I wasn't going to have much time. While we were down there, offhandedly, I asked her all kinds of things. I just wanted some idea of her thinking. You understand, I mean, how she thought. I was halfway impressed by her intelligence and, and also her education. In those days, she was one of those few whom we had attracted who had attended college. Then, right after that, one of the oldest sisters confided to me a personal problem that Sister Betty X was having. I was really surprised that when she had had the chance, Sister Betty X had not mentioned anything to me about it. Every Muslim minister is always hearing the problems of young people whose parents have ostracized them for becoming Muslims. Well, when Sister Betty X told her foster parents who were financing her education that she was a Muslim, they gave her a choice. Leave the Muslims or they'd cut off her nursing school. It was right near the end of her term, but she was hanging on to Islam. She began taking babysitting jobs for some of the doctors who lived on the grounds of the hospital where she was training. In my position... I would never have made any move without thinking how it would affect the Nation of Islam organization as a whole. I got to turning it over in my mind. What would happen if I just should happen sometime to think about getting married to somebody? For instance, Sister Betty X. Although it could be any sister in any temple, but Sister Betty X, for instance, would just happen to be the right height for somebody of my height, and also the right age. I was so shocked at myself when I realized what I was thinking. I quit going anywhere near Sister Betty X or anywhere I knew she would be. If she came into our restaurant and I was there, I went out somewhere. 
I was glad I knew that she had no idea what I had been thinking about. My not talking to her wouldn't give her any reason to think anything, since there had never been one personal word spoken between us, even if she had thought anything. I studied about if I just should happen to say something to her, what would her position be, because she wasn't going to get any chance to embarrass me. I had heard too many women bragging, I told that chump, get lost. I had too much experience of the kind to make a man very cautious. I wasn't about to say any of that romance stuff that Hollywood and television had filled women's heads with. If I was going to do something, I was going to do it directly. And anything I was going to do, I was going to do my way. And because I wanted to do it, not because I saw somebody do it or read about it in a book or saw it in a moving picture somewhere. I told Mr. Muhammad when I visited him in Chicago that month that I was thinking about a very serious step. He smiled when he heard what it was. I told him I was just thinking about it. That was all. Mr. Muhammad said that he'd like to meet this sister. The nation by this time was financially able to bear the expenses so that instructor sisters from different temples could be sent to Chicago to attend the headquarters temple two women's classes and, while there, to meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in person. Sister Betty X, of course, knew all about this, so there was no reason for her to think anything of it when it was arranged for her to go to Chicago. And like all visiting instructor sisters, she was the house guest of the messenger and Sister Clara Muhammad. Mr. Muhammad told me that he thought Sister Betty X was a fine sister. If you're thinking about doing a thing, you ought to make up your mind if you're going to do it or not do it. One Sunday night after the Temple 7 meeting... I drove my car out in the Garden State Parkway. I was on my way to visit my brother Wilfred in Detroit. Wilfred, the year before, in 1957, had been made the minister of Detroit's Temple No. 1. I hadn't seen him or any of my family in a good while. It was about 10 in the morning when I got inside Detroit. Getting gas at a filling station, I just went to their payphone on a wall. I telephoned Sister Betty X. <laughs> I had to get information to get the number of the nurse's residence at this hospital. Most numbers I memorized, but I had always made it some point never to memorize her number. Somebody got her to the phone, finally. She said, Oh, hello, Brother Minister. I just said it to her direct. Look, do you want to get married? Naturally, she acted all surprised and shocked. The more I have thought about it, to this day, I believe she was always putting on an act, because women know, they know. She said, just like I knew she would, Yes. Then I said, well, I don't have a whole lot of time. She'd better catch a plane to Detroit. So she grabbed a plane. I met her foster parents who lived in Detroit. They had made up by this time. They were very friendly and happily surprised. At least, they acted that way. Then I introduced Sister Betty X at my oldest brother Wilford's house. I had already asked him where people could get married without a whole lot of mess and waiting. He told me in Indiana. Early the next morning, I picked up Betty at her parents' home. We drove to the first town in Indiana. We found out that only a few days before, the state law had been changed, and now Indiana had a long waiting period. This was the 14th day of January, 1958, a Tuesday. We went far from Lansing, where my brother Philbert lived. I drove there. Philbert was at work when we stopped at his house, and I introduced Betty X. She and Philbert's wife were talking when I found out on the phone that we could get married in one day if we rushed. We got the necessary blood tests, and then the license. Where the certificate said religion, I wrote Muslim. Then we went to the Justice of the Peace. An old hunchback white man performed the wedding, and all the witnesses were white. Where you're supposed to say all the I do's, we did. They were all standing there smiling and watching every move. The old devil said, I pronounce you man and wife, and then kiss your bride. I got her out of there. We drove right back to New York together. The news really shook everybody in Temple 7. Some young brothers looked at me as though I had betrayed them, but everybody else was grinning like Cheshire cats. The sisters just about ate up Betty. I never will forget hearing one exclaim, You got him! That's like I was telling you, the nature of women. She'd got me. That's part of why I never have been able to shake it out of my mind that she knew something all the time. <laughs> Maybe she did get me. Anyway... We lived for the next two and a half years in Queens, sharing a house of two small apartments with Brother John Ali and his wife of that time. He's now the National Secretary in Chicago. 
Attila. Our oldest daughter was born in November 1958. She was named for Attila the Hun. He sacked Rome. Shortly after Attila came, we moved to our present seven-room house in the all-black section of Queens, Long Island. Another girl, Kubla, named after Kubla Khan, was born on Christmas Day of 1960. Then Ilyasha, Ilyas is Arabic for Elijah, was born in July of 1962. And in 1964, our fourth daughter, Amala, arrived. I guess by now, I will say, I love Betty. She's the only woman I ever thought about loving. And she's one of the very few, four women, whom I have ever trusted. The thing is, Betty's a good Muslim woman and wife. You see, Islam is the only religion that gives both husband and wife a true understanding of what love is. The Western love concept, you take it apart, it really is lust. But love transcends just the physical. Love is disposition, behavior, attitude, thoughts, likes, dislikes. These things make a beautiful woman a beautiful wife. This is the beauty that never fades. You find in your Western civilization that when a man's wife's physical beauty fails, she loses her attraction. But Islam teaches us to look into the woman and teaches her to look into us. Betty does this so she understands me. I would even say I don't imagine many other women might put up with the way I am. Awakening this brainwashed black man and telling this arrogant, devilish white man the truth about himself, Betty understands, is a full-time job. If I have work to do when I am home, the little time I am at home, she lets me have the quiet I need to work in. I'm rarely at home more than half of any week. I have been away as much as five months. I never get much chance to take her anywhere, and I know she likes to be with her husband. She is used to my calling her from airports anywhere from Boston to San Francisco or Miami to Seattle or here lately cabling her from Cairo, Accra, or the holy city of Mecca. Once on the long-distance telephone, Betty told me in beautiful phrasing the way she thinks. She said, You are present when you are away. Later that year after Betty and I were married, I exhausted myself trying to be everywhere at once, trying to help the nation to keep growing. Guest teaching at the temple in Boston, I ended as always. Who among you wish to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? And then I saw in utter astonishment that among those who were standing was my sister, Ella. We have a saying that those who are the hardest to convince make the best Muslims. And for Ella, it had taken five years. I mentioned, you will remember, how in a big city, a sizable organization can remain practically unknown unless something happens that brings it to the general public's attention. Well, certainly no one in the nation of Islam had any anticipation of the kind of thing that would happen in Harlem one night. Two white policemen breaking up a street scuffle between some Negroes ordered other Negro passerbys to move on. Of these bystanders, two happened to be Muslim brother Johnson Hinton and another brother of Temple Seven. They didn't scatter and run the way the white cops wanted. Brother Hinton was attacked with nightsticks. His scalp was split open and a police car came and he was taken to a nearby precinct. The second brother telephoned our restaurant. And with some telephone calls, in less than half an hour, about 50 of Temple Seven's men of the Fruit of Islam were standing in ranks formation outside the police precinct house. Other Negroes, curious, came running and gathered in excitement behind the Muslims. The police coming to the station house front door and looking out of the windows couldn't believe what they saw. I went in as minister of Temple Seven and demanded to see our brother. The police first said he wasn't there. Then they admitted he was, but said I couldn't see him. I said that until he was seen and we were sure he received proper medical attention, the Muslims would remain where they were. They were nervous and scared of the gathering crowd outside. When I saw our brother Hinton, it was all I could do to maintain myself. He was only semi-conscious blood, had bathed his head and face and shoulders. I hope I never again have to withstand seeing another case of sheer police brutality like that. I told the lieutenant in charge that man belongs in the hospital. They called an ambulance. When it came and Brother Hinton was taken to Harlem Hospital, we Muslims followed in loose formations for about 15 blocks along Lenox Avenue, probably the busiest thoroughfare in Harlem. Negroes who had never seen anything like this were coming out of stores and restaurants and bars and enlarging the crowd following us. The crowd was big and angry behind the Muslims in front of Harlem Hospital. 
Harlem's black people were long since sick and tired of police brutality, and they had never seen any organization of black men take a firm stand as we were. A high police official came up to me saying, Get those people out of there. I told him that our brothers were standing peacefully, disciplined perfectly, and harming no one. He told me those others behind them weren't disciplined. I politely told him those others were his problem. When doctors assured us that Brother Hinton was receiving the best of care, I gave the order and the Muslims slipped away. The other Negroes' mood was ugly, but they dispersed also when we left. We wouldn't learn until later that a steel plate would have to be put in Brother Hinton's skull. After that operation, the Nation of Islam helped him to sue. A jury awarded him over $70,000, the largest police brutality judgment that New York City has ever paid. For New York City's millions of readers of the downtown papers, it was, at that time, another one of the periodic racial unrest in Harlem stories. It was not played up because of what had happened. But the police department, to be sure, pulled out and carefully studied the files on the Nation of Islam and appraised us with new eyes. Most important in Harlem, the world's most heavily populated black ghetto, the Amsterdam news made the whole story headline news. And for the first time, the black man, woman, and child in the streets was discussing those Muslims. The Nation of Islam's relative anonymity was short-lived. In 1959, a network television program, The Mike Wallace Show, presented a report on the Muslims called The Hate That Hate Produced. Edited for maximum shock value, the show portrayed the Muslims as a militant black hate group. Reaction to the program was swift. The Muslims were reviled as reverse racists, and their leaders were called demagogues. Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, a black Boston scholar, published a book about the Nation of Islam called The Black Muslims in America. The name, Black Muslims, was adopted by the press, and it stuck, despite the nation's efforts to dislodge it. Malcolm's role continued to expand. He organized a new temple in Los Angeles. He founded the nation's official newspaper, Muhammad Speaks, and as the national media trained its attention on the Muslims, Malcolm X became their spokesman. On radio and television programs, in newspapers and magazines, he defended the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. He condemned integration and civil rights as phony attempts by the white man to deflect the black man's anger. When he was attacked by prominent black leaders of the civil rights movement, he returned their fire. Today's Uncle Tom doesn't wear a handkerchief on his head, he said. This modern 20th century Uncle Thomas now often wears a top hat. This Uncle Thomas is a professional Negro. By that I mean his profession is being a Negro for the white man. The popularity of the Nation of Islam exploded. The caravans from the East Coast temples to Chicago, once made up of a few carloads of followers, now consisted of two to three hundred chartered buses with hundreds more following in private cars. Muslim-owned businesses were proliferating. Two universities of Islam taught Muslim children in Detroit and Chicago. In 1961, the back page of Muhammad Speaks carried an architect's rendering of a proposed $20 million Islamic center in Chicago. The nation's growth exacted a toll on its leader. Racked by seizures of uncontrollable coughing, Elijah Muhammad moved to Phoenix to relieve his chronic bronchial asthma. As he receded from the public eye, Malcolm X grew correspondingly more prominent. Elijah Muhammad told him, Brother Malcolm, I want you to become well known, because if you are well known, it will make me better known. But, Brother Malcolm, there is something you need to know. You will grow to be hated when you become well known, because usually people get jealous of public figures. As far back as 1961, when Mr. Muhammad's illness took that turn for the worse, I had heard chance negative remarks concerning me. I had heard veiled implications. I had noticed other little evidences of the envy and of the jealousy which Mr. Muhammad had prophesied. For example, it was being said that Minister Malcolm is trying to take over the nation. It was being said that I was taking credit for Mr. Muhammad's teachings. It was being said that I was trying to build an empire for myself. It was being said that I loved playing coast-to-coast -coast Mr. Big Shot. 
When I heard these things, actually, they didn't anger me. They helped me to re-steal my inner resolve that such lies would never become true of me. I would always remember that Mr. Muhammad had prophesied this envy and jealousy. This would help me to ignore it because I knew that he would understand if he ever should hear such talk. A frequent rumor among non-Muslims was, Malcolm X is making a pile of money. Old Muslims at least knew better than that. Me making money? The FBI and the CIA and the IRS all combined can't turn up a thing I got beyond a car to drive and a seven-room house to live in. And by now, the nation of Islam is jealously and greedily trying to take away even that house. I had access to money, yes. Elijah Muhammad would authorize for me any amount that I had asked for. But he knew, as every Muslim official knew, that every nickel and dime I ever got was used to promote the nation of Islam. My attitude toward money generated the only domestic quarrel that I have ever had with my beloved wife, Betty. As our children increased in number, so did Betty's hints to me that I should put away something for our family. But I refused, and finally we had this argument. I put my foot down. I knew I had in Betty a wife who would sacrifice her life for me if such an occasion ever presented itself to her, but still I told her that too many organizations had been destroyed by leaders who tried to benefit personally, often goaded into it by their wives. We nearly broke up over this argument. I finally convinced Betty that if anything ever happened to me, that the nation of Islam would take care of her for the rest of her life and of our children until they were grown. I could never have been a bigger fool. In every radio or television appearance, in every newspaper interview, I have always made it crystal clear that I was Mr. Muhammad's representative. Anyone who ever heard me make a public speech during this time knows that at least once a minute, I said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches. I would refuse to talk with any person who ever tried any so-called joke about my constant reference to Mr. Muhammad. Whenever anyone said or wrote, Malcolm X, the number two black Muslim, I would recoil. I have called up reporters and asked them never to use that phrasing again, explaining to them all Muslims are number two after Mr. Muhammad. I believe that no man in the nation of Islam could have gained the international prominence I gained with the wings Mr. Muhammad had put on me, plus having the freedom that he granted me to take liberties and do things on my own, and still have remained as faithful and selfless a servant to him as I was. I would say that it was in 1962 when I began to notice that less and less about me appeared in our nation's Muhammad Speaks. I learned that Mr. Muhammad's son, Herbert, now the paper's publisher, had instructed that as little as possible be printed about me. In fact, there was more in the Muslim paper about integrationist Negro leaders than there was about me. I could read more about myself in the European, Asian, and African press. I'm not griping about publicity for myself. I already had received more publicity than many world personages. But I resented the fact that the Muslims' own newspaper denied them news of important things being done in their behalf, simply because it happened that I had done the things. I was conducting rallies, trying to propagate Mr. Muhammad's teachings, and because of jealousy and narrow-mindedness, finally I got no coverage at all. For by now, an order had been given to completely black me out of the newspaper. But I would put these things out of my mind as they occurred. At least, as much as I humanly could, I put them out of my mind. I'm not trying to make myself seem right and noble. I am telling the truth. I loved the nation and Mr. Muhammad. I lived for the nation and for Mr. Muhammad. But during 1963, I couldn't help being very hypersensitive to my critics in high posts within our nation. I quit selecting certain of my New York brothers and giving them money to go and lay groundwork for new mosques in other cities because sliding remarks were being made about Malcolm's ministers. In a time in America when it was of arch importance for a militant black voice to reach mass audiences, Life magazine wanted to do a personal story of me, and I refused. I refused again when a cover story was offered by Newsweek. I refused again when I could have been a guest on the top-rated Meet the Press television program. Each refusal was a loss for the black man and for the nation of Islam. Each refusal was a specific loss, and each refusal was made because of Chicago's attitude. There was jealousy because I had been requested to make these featured appearances. 
when a high-powered rifle slug twirled through the back of the NAACP field secretary Medgar Evers in Mississippi, I wanted to say the blunt truths that needed to be said. When a bomb was exploded in a Negro Christian church in Birmingham, Alabama, snuffing out the lives of those four beautiful little black girls, I made comments, but not what should have been said about the climate of hate that the American white man was generating and nourishing. Mr. Muhammad made me the nation's first national minister. At a late 1963 rally in Philadelphia, Mr. Muhammad, embracing me, said to that audience before us, This is my most faithful, hard-working minister. He will follow me until he dies. He had never paid such a compliment to any Muslim. No praise from any other earthly person could have meant more to me. But this would be Mr. Muhammad's and my last public appearance together. Not long before... I had been on the Jerry Williams radio program in Boston when someone handed me an item hot off the Associated Press machine. I read that a chapter of the Louisiana Citizens Council had just offered a $10,000 reward for my death. But the threat of death was much closer to me than somewhere in Louisiana. What I am telling you is the truth. When I discovered who else wanted me dead, I'm telling you. It nearly sent me to Bellevue. In my twelve years as a Muslim minister, I had always taught so strongly on the moral issues that many Muslims accused me of being anti-woman. The very keel of my teaching and my most bone-deep personal belief was that Elijah Muhammad in every aspect of his existence was a symbol of moral, mental, and spiritual reform among the American black people. For twelve years, I had taught that within the entire nation of Islam, my own transformation was the best example I knew of Mr. Mohammed's power to reform black men's lives. From the time I entered prison until I married, about twelve years later, because of Mr. Mohammed's influence upon me, I had never touched a woman. But around 1963, if anyone had noticed, I spoke less and less of religion. I taught social doctrine to Muslims and current events and politics. I stayed wholly off the subject of morality. And the reason for this was that my faith had been shaken in a way that I can never fully describe, for I had discovered Muslims had been betrayed by Elijah Muhammad himself. I want to make this as brief as I can, only enough so that my position and my reactions will be understood. As to whether or not I should reveal this, there's no longer any need for any question in my mind, for now the public knows. To make it concise, I will quote from one wire service story as it appeared in newspapers and was reported over radio and television across the United States. Los Angeles, July 3rd, UPI. Elijah Muhammad, 67-year-old leader of the Black Muslim Movement, today faced paternity suits from two former secretaries who charged he fathered their four children. Both women are in their 20s. Miss Rosary and Miss Williams charged they had intimacies with Elijah Muhammad from 1957 until this year. Miss Rosary alleged he fathered her two children and said she was expecting a third child by him. The other plaintiff said he was the father of her daughter. As far back as 1955, I had heard hints. But believe me when I tell you this. For me even to consider believing anything as insane sounding as any slightest implication of any immoral behavior of Mr. Muhammad, why, the very idea made me shake with fear. And so my mind simply refused to accept anything so grotesque as adultery mentioned in the same breath with Mr. Muhammad's name. Adultery. Why, any Muslim guilty of adultery was summarily ousted in disgrace. One of the nation's most closely kept scandals was that a succession of the personal secretaries of Mr. Muhammad had become pregnant. They were brought before Muslim courts and charged with adultery, and they confessed. Humiliated before the general body, they received sentences from one to five years of isolation. That meant they were to have no contact whatsoever with any other Muslims. No one in the world could have convinced me that Mr. Muhammad would betray the reverence bestowed upon him by all of those mosques full of poor, trusting Muslims nickling and diming up to faithfully support the nation of Islam, when many of those faithful were scarcely able to pay their own rents. But by late 1962, 
I learned reliably that numerous Muslims were leaving Mosque too in Chicago. The ugly rumor was spreading swiftly, even among non-Muslim Negroes. When I thought of how the press constantly sought ways to discredit the nation of Islam, I trembled to think of such a thing reaching the ears of some newspaper reporter, either black or white. There was no one I could turn to with this problem except Mr. Muhammad himself. Ultimately, that had to be the case. But first, I went to Chicago to see Mr. Muhammad's second youngest son, Wallace Muhammad. I felt that Wallace was Mr. Muhammad's most strongly spiritual son, the son with the most objective outlook. Always, Wallace and I had shared an exceptional closeness and trust. And Wallace knew when he saw me why I had come to see him. I know, he said. I said, I, I thought we should rally to help his father. Wallace said he didn't feel that his father would welcome any efforts to help him. I told myself that Wallace must be crazy. Next, I broke the rule that no Muslim is supposed to have any contact with another Muslim in the isolated state. I looked up and talked with three of the former secretaries to Mr. Muhammad. From their own mouths, I heard the stories of who had fathered their children. And from their own mouths, I heard that Elijah Muhammad had told them I was the best, greatest minister he ever had, but that someday I would leave him, turn against him. So I was dangerous. I learned from these former secretaries of Mr. Muhammad that while he was praising me to my face, he was tearing me apart behind my back. That deeply hurt me. Every day I was meeting the microphones, cameras, press reporters, and other commitments, including the Muslims of my own Mosque 7. I felt almost out of my mind. Finally, the thing crystallized for me. As long as I did nothing... I felt it was the same as being disloyal. I felt that as long as I sat down, I was not helping Mr. Muhammad when somebody needed to be standing up. So one night I wrote to Mr. Muhammad about the poison being spread about him. He telephoned me in New York. He said that when he saw me, he would discuss it. I desperately wanted to find some way, some kind of bridge, over which I was certain the nation of Islam could be saved from self-destruction. I had faith in the nation. We weren't some group of Christian Negroes jumping and shouting and full of sins. I thought of one bridge that could be used if and when the shattering disclosure should become public. Loyal Muslims could be taught that a man's accomplishments in his life outweigh his personal human weaknesses. Wallace Muhammad helped me to review the Koran and the Bible for documentation. David's adultery with Bathsheba weighed less on history scales, for instance, than the positive fact of David's killing Goliath. Thinking of Lot, we think not of incest, but of his saving the people from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Or, our image of Noah isn't of his getting drunk, but of his building the ark and teaching people to save themselves from the flood. We think of Moses leading the Hebrews from bondage, not of Moses' adultery with the Ethiopian women. In all of the cases I reviewed, the positive outweighed the negative. Elijah Muhammad had me fly to Phoenix to see him in April 1963. We embraced as always, and almost immediately he took me outside where we began to walk by his swimming pool. He was the messenger of Allah. When I was a foul, vicious convict, so evil that other convicts had called me Satan, this man had rescued me. He was the man who had trained me, who had treated me as if I were his own flesh and blood. He was the man who had given me wings to go places, to do things I otherwise never would have dreamed of. We walked, with me caught up in a whirlwind of emotions. Well, son, Mr. Muhammad said, what is on your mind? Plainly. Frankly, pulling no punches, I told Mr. Muhammad what was being said. And without waiting for any response from him, I said that with his son Wallace's help, I had found in the Quran and the Bible that which might be taught to Muslims if it became necessary as the fulfillment of prophecy. A son, I'm not surprised, Elijah Muhammad said. You always have had such a good understanding of prophecy and of spiritual things. You recognize that's what all of this is. Prophecy. You have the kind of understanding that only an old man has. I'm David, he said. When you read about how David took another man's wife, I'm that David. You read about Noah, who got drunk, that's me. You read about Lot, who went and laid up with his own daughters. 
I have to fulfill all of those things. Hoping to ease the blow of their leader's indiscretions, Malcolm X took it upon himself to tell a select group of East Coast Muslim officials what had happened. Several of them, he discovered, already knew. Then, his attempt to put out the fire exploded in his face. In Chicago, temple officials accused Malcolm X of demeaning the character of Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm was shocked by their reaction, but it was only the first of a succession of revelations. On November 22, 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. Elijah Muhammad immediately issued a directive to his ministers to make no comment concerning the assassination. At a speaking engagement a few days later, Malcolm X was asked his opinion of Kennedy's death. He said what he felt, that it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. The white man's hate, he said, had spread beyond the killing of innocent blacks and now had reached America's president. The climate of hate and violence in America was cited by many world leaders and journalists as a reason for Kennedy's murder. But when Malcolm X said it, the nation's newspapers screamed in outrage, and to Malcolm it revealed another hard truth. The jealousies that Elijah Muhammad had prophesied were manifest in Elijah Muhammad himself. The Muslim leader seized on Malcolm's Kennedy comment as a reason to first silence and then banish his principal minister. But Malcolm soon learned his ouster was not enough. The Muslims wanted his life. The first direct order for my death was issued through a Mosque 7 official who previously had been a close assistant. Another previously close assistant of mine was assigned to do the job. He was a brother with a knowledge of demolition. He was asked to wire my car to explode when I turned the ignition key. But this brother, it happened, had seen too much of my loyalty to the nation to carry out his order. Instead, he came to me. I thanked him for my life. I told him what was really going on in Chicago. He was stunned almost beyond belief. This brother was close to others in the Moss 7 circle who might subsequently be called upon to eliminate me. He said he would take it upon himself to enlighten each of them enough so that they wouldn't allow themselves to be used. This first direct death order was how finally I began to arrive at my psychological divorce from the nation of Islam. I began to see wherever I went, on the streets, in business places, on elevators, sidewalks, and passing cars, the faces of Muslims whom I knew, and I knew that any of them might be waiting the opportunity to try to put a bullet into me. I was racking my brain. What was I going to do? My life was inseparably committed to the American black man's struggle. I was generally regarded as a leader. For years I had attacked so many so-called black leaders for their shortcomings. Now I had to honestly ask myself what I could offer, how I was genuinely qualified to help the black people win their struggle for human rights. I had enough experience to know that in order to be a good organizer of anything which you expect to succeed, including yourself, you must almost mathematically analyze cold facts. I had, as one asset I knew, an international image. No amount of money could have bought that. I knew that if I said something newsworthy, people would read or hear of it, maybe even around the world depending on what it was more immediately in New York City, where I would naturally base any operation I had a large, direct, personal following of non-Muslims. I knew that the great lack of most of the big-named Negro leaders was their lack of any true rapport with the ghetto Negroes. How could they have rapport when they spent most of their time integrating with white people? I knew that the ghetto people knew that I never left the ghetto in spirit, and I never left it physically any more than I had to. I had a ghetto instinct. For instance, I could feel if tension was beyond normal in a ghetto audience, and I could speak and understand the ghetto's language. There was an example of this that always flew into my mind every time I heard some of the big-name Negro leaders declaring they spoke for the ghetto black people. After a Harlem street rally, one of these downtown leaders and I were talking when we were approached by a Harlem hustler. 
To my knowledge, I'd never seen this hustler before. He said to me approximately, Hey, baby, I dig you holding this all original scene at the track. I'm going to lay a vine under the Jew's balls for a dime. Got to give you a play. Got the shorts out here trying to scuffle up on some bread. Well, my man, I I'll get on. Got to go peck a little and cop me some Z's. And the hustler went on up 7th Avenue. I never would have given it another thought except that this downtown leader was standing, staring after that hustler looking as if he just heard Sanskrit. He asked me what had been said, and I told him. The hustler had said he was aware that the Muslims were holding an all-black bazaar at Rockland Palace, which is primarily a dance hall. The hustler intended to pawn a suit for $10 to attend and patronize the bazaar. He had very little money, but he was trying hard to make some. He was going to eat, then he would get some sleep. The point that I'm making is that as a leader, I could talk over the ABC, CBS, or NBC microphones at Harvard or at Tuskegee. I could talk with the so-called middle-class Negro and with the ghetto blacks, whom all the other leaders just talked about. And because I had been a hustler, I knew better than all whites knew and better than nearly all the black leaders knew that actually the most dangerous black man in America was the ghetto hustler. Why do I say this? The hustler out there in the ghetto jungles has less respect for the white power structure than any other Negro in North America. The ghetto hustler is internally restrained by nothing. He has no religion, no concept of morality, no civic responsibility, no fear, nothing. To survive, he is out there constantly preying upon others, probing for any human weaknesses like a ferret. The ghetto hustler is forever frustrated, restless, and anxious for some action. Whatever he undertakes, he commits himself to it fully. Absolutely. What makes the ghetto hustler yet more dangerous is his glamour image to the school dropout youth in the ghetto. These ghetto teenagers see the hell caught by their parents struggling to get somewhere or see that they have given up struggling in the prejudiced, intolerant white man's world. The ghetto teenagers make up their own minds that they would rather be like the hustler who they see dressed sharp and flashing money and displaying no respect for anybody or anything. So the ghetto youth become attracted to the hustler worlds of dope, thievery, prostitution, and general crime and immorality. It scared me the first time I really saw the danger of these ghetto teenagers if they are ever sparked into violence. One sweltering summer afternoon, I attended a Harlem street rally which contained a lot of these teenagers in the crowd. I had been invited by some responsible Negro leaders who normally never spoke to me. I knew they had just used my name to help them draw a crowd. The more I thought about it on the way there, the hotter I got. And when I got on the stand, I just told the crowd in the street that I wasn't really wanted up there, that my name had been used, and I walked off the speaker's stand. Well, what did I want to do that for? Well, those young teenage Negroes got upset and started milling around and yelling, upsetting the older Negroes in the crowd. The first thing you know, traffic was blocked in four directions by a crowd whose mood quickly grew so ugly that I really got apprehensive. I got on top of a car and began waving my arms and yelling at them to quiet down. They did quiet. And then I asked them to disperse, and they did. This was when it began being said that I was America's only Negro who could stop a race riot cold or start one. I don't know if I could do either one, but I know one thing. It had taught me in a very few minutes to have a whole lot of respect for the human combustion that is packed among the hustlers and the young admirers who live in the ghettos where the northern white man has sealed off the Negro away from whites for a hundred years. In the end, I reasoned that the decision already had been made for me. I felt a challenge to plan and build an organization that could help to cure the black man in North America of the sickness which has kept him under the white man's heel. Substantially, as I saw it, the organization I hoped to build would differ from the Nation of Islam in that it would embrace all faiths of black men and would carry into practice what the Nation of Islam had only preached. Rumors were swirling particularly in East Coast cities. What was I going to do? Well, the first thing I was going to have to do was to attract far more willing hands and heads than my own. Each day, 
More militant action brothers who had been with me in Mosque 7 announced their break from the Nation of Islam to come with me, and each day I learned in one or another way of more support from non-Muslim Negroes, including a surprising lot of the middle and upper class black bourgeoisie who were sick of the status symbol charade. There was a growing clamor. When are you going to call a meeting to get organized? To hold the first meeting, I arranged to rent the Carver Ballroom at the Hotel Teresa, which is at the corner of 125th Street and 7th Avenue, which might be called one of Harlem's fuse box locations. The Amsterdam News reported the planned meeting, and many readers inferred that we were establishing our beginning mosque in the Teresa. Telegrams and letters and telephone calls came to the hotel for me from across the country. The general tone was that this was a move that people had waited for. People I'd never heard of expressed confidence in me in moving ways. Numerous people said that the Nation of Islam's stringent moral restrictions had repelled them, and they wanted to join me. Astonishing numbers of white people called and wrote offering contributions or asking, could they join? The answer was no, they couldn't join. Our membership was all black, but if their consciences dictated, they could financially help our constructive approach to America's race problem. Speaking engagement requests came in, 22 of them in one particular Monday morning's mail. It was startling to me that an unusual number of the requests came from groups of white Christian ministers. I called a press conference. The microphones stuck up before me. The flashbulbs popped. The reporters, men and women, white and black, representing media that reached around the world, sat looking at me with their pencils and open notebooks. I made the announcement. I am going to organize and head a new mosque in New York City known as the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. This will give us a religious base and a spiritual force necessary to rid our people of the vices that destroy the moral fiber of our community. Muslim Mosque Incorporated will have its temporary headquarters in the Hotel Teresa in Harlem. It will be the working base for an action program designed to eliminate the political oppression, the economic exploitation, and the social degradation suffered daily by 22 million Afro-Americans. Then the reporters began firing questions at me. It was not all as simple as it may sound. I went few places without constant awareness that any number of my former brothers felt they would make heroes of themselves in the nation of Islam if they killed me. I knew how Elijah Muhammad's followers thought. I had taught so many of them to think. I knew that no one would kill you quicker than a Muslim if he felt that's what Allah wanted him to do. There was one further major preparation that I knew I needed. I'd had it in mind for a long time as a servant of Allah, but it would require money that I didn't have. I took a plane to Boston. I was turning again to my sister Ella. Though at times I'd made Ella angry at me beneath it all since I had first come to her as a teenaged hick from Michigan, Ella had never once really wavered from my corner. Ella, I said, I want to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. Ella said, how much do you need? Malcolm X's life was characterized by sudden dramatic change. From small town boy to big city hustler, from convict to worldwide prominence as a leader of and spokesman for his people, his pilgrimage to Mecca would inspire one more seminal change. For the first time in his life, everyone he met, from statesmen to shepherds, treated him as an equal, as a fellow human being, without regard for the color of his skin. All along his journey, he met people, black, brown, white, red, and yellow people, who helped him realize his dream. In New York, Dr. Mahmoud Youssef Shwabi, a professor at the University of Cairo and a United Nations advisor, gave him a signed letter approving his pilgrimage as required by the Saudi Arabian consulate. Dr. Shwabi also gave Malcolm a book, The Eternal Message of Muhammad. He told Malcolm that the book's author, Abdul al-Rahman Assam, was a close advisor of the Arabian ruler, Prince Faisal. Assam, he said, had followed the stories of Malcolm X in the press closely. It was the first of many signs, Malcolm felt, 
that Allah was with him. His experience in Mecca awakened in Malcolm a feeling he had never known, a sense of idealism, of hope that perhaps, after all, people could live together as brothers. While still in Mecca, he summed up his experience and his feelings in a letter. I have reflected since that the letter I finally sat down to compose had been subconsciously shaping itself in my mind. The colorblindness of the Muslim world's religious society and the colorblindness of the Muslim world's human society, these two influences had each day been making a greater impact and an increasing persuasion against my previous way of thinking. The first letter was, of course, to my wife, Betty. I never had a moment's question that Betty, after initial amazement, would change her thinking to join mine. I had known a thousand reassurances that Betty's faith in me was total. I knew that she would see what I had seen, that in the land of Muhammad and the land of Abraham, I had been blessed by Allah with new insight into the true religion of Islam and a better understanding of America's entire racial dilemma. After the letter to my wife, I wrote next essentially the same letter to my sister Ella, and I knew where Ella would stand. She had been saving to make the pilgrimage to Mecca herself. I wrote to Dr. Shawarbi, whose belief in my sincerity had enabled me to get a passport to Mecca. All through the night, I copied similar long letters for others who were very close to me. Among them was Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace Muhammad, who had expressed to me his conviction that the only possible salvation for the nation of Islam would be its accepting and projecting a better understanding of orthodox Islam. And I wrote to my loyal assistants at my newly formed Muslim Mosque Incorporated in Harlem, with a note appended, asking that my letter be duplicated and distributed to the press. I knew that when my letter became public knowledge back in America, many would be astounded, loved ones, friends, and enemies alike. And no less astounded would be millions whom I did not know, who had gained during my twelve years with Elijah Muhammad a hate image of Malcolm X. Even I was myself astounded. But there was a precedent in my life for this letter. My whole life has been a chronology of changes. Here is what I wrote from my heart. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as is practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all the other prophets and of the holy scriptures. For the past week I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed all around me by people of all colors. I have been blessed to visit the holy city of Mecca. I have made my seven circuits around the Kaaba, led by a young Mutawaf named Muhammad. I drank water from the well of Zemzem. I ran seven times back and forth between the hills of Mount Asafa and Al Marwa. I have prayed in the ancient city of Mina, and I have prayed on Mount Arafat. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world, they were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans. But we were all participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experiences in America had led me to believe never could exist between the white and the non-white. America needs to understand Islam, because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white, but the white attitude was removed from their minds by the religion of Islam. I have never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together, irrespective of their color. You may be shocked by these words coming from me, but on this pilgrimage, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held and to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. During the past eleven days here in the Muslim world, I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, and slept in the same bed or on the same rug while praying to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. 
and in the words and in the actions and in the deeds of the white Muslims, I felt the same sincerity that I felt among the black African Muslims of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. We were truly all the same brothers because their belief in one God had removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from their attitude. I could see from this that perhaps if white Americans could accept the oneness of God, then perhaps, too, they could accept in reality the oneness of man and cease to measure and hinder and harm others in terms of their differences in color. Each hour here in the Holy Land enables me to have greater spiritual insights into what is happening in America between black and white. The American Negro can never be blamed for his racial animosities. He is only reacting to 400 years of the conscious racism of American whites. But as racism leads America off the suicide path, I do believe from the experiences that I have had with them that the whites of the younger generation in the colleges and universities will see the handwriting on the wall and many of them will turn to the spiritual path of truth, the only way left to America to ward off the disaster that racism inevitably must lead to. Never have I been so highly honored. Never have I been made to feel more humble and unworthy who would believe the blessings that have been heaped upon an American Negro? A few nights ago, a man who would be called in America a white man, a United Nations diplomat, an ambassador, a companion of kings, gave me his hotel suite, his bed. By this man, His Excellency Prince Faisal, who rules this holy land, was made aware of my presence here in Jeddah. The very next morning, Prince Faisal's son, in person, informed me that by the will and decree of his esteemed father, I was to be a state guest. The deputy chief of protocol himself took me before the Hajj court. His Holiness Sheikh Muhammad Harkun himself okayed my visit to Mecca. His Holiness gave me two books on Islam with his personal seal and autograph, and he told me that he prayed that I would be a successful preacher of Islam in America. A car a driver and a guide have been placed at my disposal, making it possible for me to travel about this holy land almost at will. The government provides air-conditioned quarters and servants in each city that I visit. Never would I have even thought of dreaming that I would ever be a recipient of such honors, honors that in America would be bestowed upon a king, not a Negro. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Sincerely, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. When his pilgrimage was over, Malcolm X did not go directly home. He went instead to Lebanon, and from there back to Egypt, and then to Nigeria and Ghana. At all of these stops, he was treated as a visiting dignitary. He addressed students at leading universities and met with heads of state and he was again struck by what was missing from these African cultures, the racial hatred that permeated the United States. He celebrated his 39th birthday in Algiers, waiting for his flight back to America. It would be his final birthday. The Pan American jet which took me home, it was flight 115, landed at New York's Kennedy Air Terminal on May 21st at 4.25 in the afternoon. We passengers filed off the plane and toward customs. When I saw the crowd of 50 or 60 reporters and photographers, I honestly wondered what celebrity I had been on the plane with. But I was the villain they had come to meet. In Harlem especially, and also in some other U.S. cities, the 1964 long, hot summer's predicted explosions had begun. Article after article in the white man's press had cast me as a symbol, if not a causative agent, of the revolt and of the violence of the American black man wherever it had sprung up. In the biggest press conference that I had ever experienced anywhere, the camera bulbs flashed and the reporters fired questions. Mr. Malcolm X, what about those blood brothers reportedly affiliated with your organization, reportedly trained for violence, who have killed innocent white people? Mr. Malcolm X, what about your comment that Negroes should form rifle clubs? I answered the questions. I knew I was back in America again, hearing the subjective, scapegoat-seeking questions of the white man. 
New York white youth were killing victims. That was a sociological problem. But when black youth killed somebody, the power structure was looking to hang somebody. When black men had been lynched or otherwise murdered in cold blood, it was always said, things will get better. When whites had rifles in their homes, the Constitution gave them the right to protect their home and themselves. But when black people even spoke of having rifles in their homes, that was ominous. I slipped in on the reporters something they hadn't been expecting. I said that the American black man needed to quit thinking what the white man had taught him, which was that the black man had no alternative except to beg for his so-called civil rights. I said that the American black man needed to recognize that he had a strong, airtight case to take to the United States before the United Nations on a formal accusation of denial of human rights, and that if Angola and South Africa were precedent cases, then there would be no easy way that the United States could escape being censored right on its own home ground. Just as I had known, the press wanted to get me off that subject. I was asked about my letter from Mecca, I was all set with a speech regarding that. I hope that once and for all my Hajj to the holy city of Mecca has established our Muslim mosque's authentic religious affiliation with the 750 million Muslims of the Orthodox Islamic world. And I know once and for all that the black Africans look upon America's 22 million blacks as long-lost brothers. They love us. They study our struggle for freedom. They were so happy to hear how we are awakening from our long sleep after so-called Christian white America had taught us to be ashamed of our African brothers and homeland. Yes, I wrote a letter from Mecca. You're asking me, didn't you say that now you accept white men as brothers? Well, my answer is that in the Muslim world I saw, I felt, and I wrote home how my thinking was broadened. Just as I wrote, I shared true brotherly love with many white-complexioned Muslims who never gave a single thought to the race or to the complexion of another Muslim. It was in the holy world that my attitude was changed, by what I experienced there, by what I witnessed there in terms of brotherhood, not just brotherhood toward me, but brotherhood between all men of all nationalities and complexions who were there. And now that I am back in America, my attitude here concerning white people has to be governed by what my black brothers and I experience here and what we witness here in terms of brotherhood. The problem here in America is that we meet such a small minority of individual so-called good or brotherly white people. Here in the United States, notwithstanding those few good white people, it is the collective 150 million white people whom the collective 22 million black people have to deal with. Why, here in America, the seeds of racism are so deeply rooted in the white people collectively, their belief that they are superior in some way is so deeply rooted that these things are in the national white subconsciousness. Many whites are even actually unaware of their own racism until they face some test and then their racism emerges in one form or another. Listen, the white man's racism toward the black man here in America is what has got him in such trouble all over this world with other non-white peoples. The white man can't separate himself from the stigma that he automatically feels about anyone, no matter who, who is not his color. And the non-white peoples of the world are sick of the condescending white man. That's why you've got all this trouble in places like Vietnam or right here in the Western Hemisphere. Probably 100 million people of African descent are divided against each other, taught by their white man to hate and to mistrust each other. In the West Indies, Cuba, Brazil, Venezuela, all of South America, Central America, all of those lands are full of people with African blood. On the African continent even, the white man has maneuvered to divide the black African from the brown Arab, to divide the so-called Christian African from the Muslim African. Can you imagine what can happen, what would certainly happen if all these African heritage people ever realize their blood bonds, if they ever realize they all have a common goal, if they ever unite. The press was glad to get rid of me that day. I believe that the black brothers whom I had just recently left in Africa would have felt that I did the subject justice. Nearly through the night, my telephone at home kept ringing. My black brothers and sisters around New York and in some other cities were calling to congratulate me on what they had heard on the radio and television news broadcasts, and people, mostly white, were wanting to know if I would speak here or there. The next day, 
I was in my car driving along the freeway when at a red light another car pulled alongside. A white woman was driving and on the passenger's side next to me was a white man. Malcolm X, he called out. And when I looked, he stuck his hand out of his car, across at me, grinning. Do you mind shaking hands with a white man? Imagine that. Just as the traffic light turned green, I told him, I don't mind shaking hands with human beings. Are you one? One of the major troubles I was having in building the organization I wanted, an all-black organization whose ultimate objective was to help create a society in which there could exist honest white-black brotherhood, was that my earlier public image, my old so-called black Muslim image, kept blocking me. I was trying to gradually reshape that image. I was trying to turn a corner into a new regard by the public, especially Negroes. I was no less angry than I had been, but at the same time, the true brotherhood I had seen in the Holy Land had influenced me to recognize that anger can blind human vision. Every free moment I could find. I did a lot of talking to key people whom I knew around Harlem, and I made a lot of speeches saying, True Islam taught me that it takes all of the religious, political, economic, psychological, and racial ingredients, all characteristics, to make the human family and the human society complete. I said to Harlem Street audiences that only when mankind would submit to the one God who created all, only then would mankind even approach the peace of which so much talk could be heard, but toward which so little action was seen. I said that on the American racial level, we had to approach the black man's struggle against the white man's racism as a human problem. That we had to forget hypocritical politics and propaganda. I said that both races, as human beings, had the obligation, the responsibility, of helping to correct America's human problem. The well-meaning white people, I said, had to combat actively and directly the racism in other white people. And the black people had to build within themselves much greater awareness that along with equal rights, there had to be the bearing of equal responsibilities. I knew, better than most Negroes, how many white people truly wanted to see American racial problems solved. I knew that many whites were as frustrated as Negroes. I'll bet I got 50 letters some days from white people. The white people in meeting audiences would throng around me asking me after I had addressed them somewhere, what can a sincere white person do? The first thing I tell them is that at least with my own particular black nationalist organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity is concerned, they can't join us. I have these very deep feelings that white people who want to join black organizations are really just taking the escapist way to salve their consciences. By visibly hovering near us, they are proving that they are with us. But the hard truth is, this isn't helping to solve America's racist problem. The Negroes aren't the racists. Where the really sincere white people have got to do their proving of themselves is not among the black victims, but out on the battle lines of where America's racism really is, and that's in their own home communities. America's racism is among their own fellow whites, that's where the sincere whites who really mean to accomplish something have got to work. Aside from that, I mean nothing against any sincere whites when I say that as members of black organizations, generally whites' very presence subtly renders the black organization automatically less effective. Even the best white members will slow down the Negroes' discovery of what they need to do, and particularly of what they can do for themselves, working by themselves among their own kind in their own communities. I tell sincere white people, work in conjunction with us, each of us working among our own kind. Let sincere white individuals find all other white people they can who feel as they do, and let them form their own all-white groups to work trying to convert other white people who are thinking and acting so racist. Let sincere whites go and teach nonviolence to white people. We will completely respect our white co-workers. They will deserve every credit. We will give them every credit. We will meanwhile be working among our own kind in our own black communities, showing and teaching black men in ways that only other black men can, that the black man has got to help himself, working separately, 
the sincere white people and sincere black people actually will be working together. In our mutual sincerity, we might be able to show a road to the salvation of America's very soul. It can only be salvaged if human rights and dignity in full are extended to black men. Only such real, meaningful actions as those which are sincerely motivated from a deep sense of humanism and moral responsibility can get at the basic causes that produce the racial explosions in America today. Otherwise, the racial explosions are only going to grow worse. Certainly nothing is going to be solved by throwing upon me or other so-called black extremists and demagogues the blame for the racism that is in America. Sometimes I have dared to dream to myself that one day history may even say that my voice, which disturbed the white man's smugness and his arrogance and his complacency, that my voice helped to save America from a grave, possibly even a fatal catastrophe. The goal has always been the same, but the approaches to it as different as mine and Dr. Martin Luther King's nonviolent marching that dramatized the brutality and the evil of the white man against defenseless blacks. And in the racial climate of this country today, it is anybody's guess which of the extremes in approach to the black man's problems might personally meet a fatal catastrophe first, nonviolent Dr. King or so-called violent me. Anything I do today, I regard as urgent. No man is given but so much time to accomplish whatever is his life's work. My life, in particular, never has stayed fixed in any one position for very long. You have seen how throughout my life I have often known unexpected drastic changes. I am only facing the facts when I know that any moment of any day or any night could bring me death. This is particularly true since the last trip that I made abroad. I have seen the nature of things that are happening, and I have heard things from sources which are reliable. To speculate about dying doesn't disturb me as it might some people. I have never felt that I would live to become an old man. Even before I was a Muslim, when I was a hustler in the ghetto jungle and then a criminal in prison, it always stayed on my mind that I would die a violent death. In fact, it runs in my family. My father and most of his brothers died by violence, my father because of what he believed in. To come right down to it, if I take the kind of things in which I believe, then add to that the kind of temperament that I have, plus the 100% dedication I have to whatever I believe in, these are ingredients which make it just about impossible for me to die of old age. I have given to this book so much of whatever time I have because I feel and I hope that if I honestly and fully tell my life's account, read objectively, it might prove to be a testimony of some social value. I think that an objective reader may see how in the society to which I was exposed as a black youth here in America, for me to wind up in prison was really just about inevitable. It happens to so many thousands of black youth. I think that an objective reader may see how when I heard the white man is the devil, when I played back what had been my own experiences, it was inevitable that I would respond positively. Then the next twelve years of my life were devoted and dedicated to propagating that phrase among black people. I think, I hope, that the objective reader in following my life, the life of only one ghetto-created Negro, may gain a better picture and understanding than he has previously had of the black ghettos, which are shaping the lives and the thinking of almost all of the 22 million Negroes who live in America. Thicker, each year in these ghettos is the kind of teenager that I was, the wrong kinds of heroes and the wrong kinds of influences. I'm not saying that all of them become the kind of parasite that I was. Fortunately, by far, most do not. But still, the small fraction who do add up to an annual total of more and more costly, dangerous, youthful criminals. The FBI not long ago released a report of a shocking rise in crime each successive year since the end of World War II, 10 to 12 percent each year. The report did not say so in so many words, but I am saying that the majority of that crime increase is annually spawned in the black ghettos which the American racist society permits to exist. 
In the 1964 long, hot summer riots in major cities across the United States, the socially disinherited black ghetto youth were always at the forefront. In this year, 1965, I am certain that more and worse riots are going to erupt in yet more cities in spite of the conscience-salving civil rights bill. The reason is that the cause of these riots, the racist malignancy in America, has been too long unattended. I believe that it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who has lived further down in the mud of human society than I have, or a black man who has been any more ignorant than I have been, or a black man who has suffered more anguish during his life than I have. But it is only after the deepest darkness that the greatest joy can come. It is only after slavery and prison that the sweetest appreciation of freedom can come. For the freedom of my 22 million black brothers and sisters here in America, I do believe that I have fought the best that I know how and the best that I could with the shortcomings that I have had. I know that my shortcomings are many. My greatest lack has been, I believe, that I don't have the kind of academic education I wish I had been able to get, to have been a lawyer, perhaps. I do believe that I might have been a good lawyer, I have always loved verbal battle and challenge. You can believe me that if I had the time right now, I would not be one bit ashamed to go back into any New York City public school and start where I left off in ninth grade and go on through a degree. Because I don't begin to be academically equipped for so many of the interests that I have. For instance, I love languages. I wish I were an accomplished linguist. I don't know anything more frustrating than to be around people talking something you can't understand especially when there are people who look like you. In Africa, I heard original mother tongues such as Hausa and Swahili being spoken, and there I was standing like some little boy waiting for someone to tell me what had been said. I never will forget how ignorant I felt. Every morning when I wake up now, I regard it as having another borrowed day. In any city, wherever I go, making speeches, holding meetings of my organization or attending to other business, black men are watching every move I make awaiting their chance to kill me. I have said publicly many times that I know they have their orders. Anyone who chooses not to believe what I am saying doesn't know the Muslims in the nation of Islam. But I am also blessed with faithful followers who are, I believe, as dedicated to me as I once was to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. Those who would hunt a man need to remember that a jungle also contains those who hunt the hunters. I know, too, that I could suddenly die at the hands of some white racists, or I could die at the hands of some Negro hired by the white man, or it could be some brainwashed Negro acting on his own idea that by eliminating me he would be helping out the white man because I talk about the white man the way I do. Anyway, now... Each day I live as if I am already dead. And I tell you what I would like for you to do. When I am dead, and I say it that way because from the things I know, I do not expect to live long enough to read this book in its finished form. I want you to just watch and see if I'm not right in what I say. That the white man in his press is going to identify me with hate. He will make use of me dead as he has made use of me alive as a convenient symbol of hatred. And that will help him to escape facing the truth that all I have been doing is holding up a mirror to reflect, to show the history of unspeakable crimes that his race has committed against my race. You watch. I will be labeled as, at best, an irresponsible black man. I have always felt about this accusation that the black leader whom white men consider to be responsible is invariably the black leader who never gets any results. You can only get action as a black man if you are regarded by the white man as irresponsible. In fact, this much I had learned when I was just a little boy. And since I have been some kind of a leader of black people here in the racist society of America, I have been more reassured each time the white man resisted me or attacked me harder, because each time made me more certain that I was on the right track in the American black man's best interests. 
The racist white man's opposition automatically made me know that I did offer the black man something worthwhile. Yes, I have cherished my demagogue role. I know that societies often have killed the people who have helped to change those societies. And if I can die having brought any light, having exposed any meaningful truth that will help to destroy the racist cancer that is malignant in the body of America, then all of the credit is due to Allah. Only the mistakes have been mine. Malcolm X, who was now El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, spent the months following his return from Mecca building his new organization of Afro-American unity and delivering his message of hope. True Islam, he told his audiences, taught me that it takes all of the religious, political, economic, psychological, and racial ingredients or characteristics to make the human family and the human society complete. In spite of a rash of death threats, he kept up his schedule, traveling across the country and to Europe and again to Africa. On Saturday, February 14, 1965, flaming gasoline bombs were hurled through the front window of his home, virtually destroying it. Malcolm and his family barely escaped. He arranged for emergency housing and rearranged his schedule so he and Sister Betty could find a new home. A week later, they did find one, and Malcolm asked for advances from the publisher of his autobiography so they could make the down payment and move in. He didn't live to make the move. On Sunday, February 21st, Malcolm X was assassinated at the Audubon Ballroom in New York City. He had just been introduced to the audience and had issued his familiar greeting, Assalamu brothers and sisters. A scuffle erupted near the front of the crowd, and as the audience's attention was diverted to it, several gunmen stood up in the front row and opened fire. Eyewitnesses also reported seeing two men rushing toward the stage, one with a shotgun, the other with two revolvers. Malcolm X clutched his chest as the bullets hit him and toppled backwards stiffly. Malcolm X's wife and daughters were there that day. After throwing her body over her shrieking children, Sister Betty scrambled up and ran to her fallen husband's side, crying, My husband, they're killing my husband. Two people tried to administer artificial respiration. It was futile. As Sister Betty came through the crowd on stage, they moved aside. She fell to her knees next to his body, sobbing. They killed him. The body of Malcolm X was scheduled to go on public view on Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. at the Unity Funeral Home in Harlem on the east side of 8th Avenue between 126th and 127th Streets. At 2.15 that morning, an explosion and fire destroyed Muslim Mosque No. 7, along with seven street-level stores around it, including the Muslim restaurant. At the funeral home, telephone bomb threats began coming in around noon, and the crowds that had been standing behind police barricades, waiting to view the body, were not allowed in until after seven in the evening. In the next few hours, 2,000 people filed past the open coffin. By the time the doors closed late Friday night, an estimated 22,000 people had viewed the body. The viewing was interrupted for a time on Friday afternoon with the arrival of Sheikh Ahmed Hassan and his party. Hassan, a Sunni Muslim who had met Malcolm X in Mecca and had come to the United States to serve as his spiritual advisor, was not there to simply view the body, but to prepare it for burial in accordance with the Muslim ritual. He removed the dark suit that had clothed Malcolm's body and washed the body in holy oil. Then he draped the body in seven white linen shrouds so that only the face was visible. After he read passages from the Koran, he told the funeral home representative, now the body is ready for burial. The funeral at the Faith Temple at 147th Street and Amsterdam Avenue drew thousands more. People began gathering at 6 a.m. in the February cold. It was a Christian church, but no Christian symbols were in view. Any hint of Christianity in the services would make the deceased a kafir, an unbeliever. 
Actor Ossie Davis and his wife Ruby D read notes, telegrams, and cables of condolence from around the world. Omar Osman, a representative of the Islam Center of Switzerland and the United States, drew applause when he said, The highest thing that a Muslim can aspire to is to die on the battlefield and not die at his bedside. Those who die on the battlefield are not dead, but are alive. Then Ossie Davis stood again, and this was his eulogy to Malcolm X. Here, at this final hour, in this quiet place, Harlem has come to bid farewell to one of its brightest hopes, extinguished now and gone from us forever. Many will ask what Harlem finds to honor in this stormy, controversial, and bold young captain, and we will smile. They will say that he is of hate, a fanatic, a racist, who can only bring evil to the cause for which you struggle. And we will answer and say unto them, Did you ever talk to Brother Malcolm? Did you ever touch him or have him smile at you? Did you ever really listen to him? For if you did, you would know him. And if you knew him, you would know why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. And we will know him then for what he was and is, a prince, our own black shining prince, who didn't hesitate to die because he loved us so. Malcolm X was buried at Ferncliff Cemetery in Ardsley, New York, about 18 miles outside of Manhattan. As the 80-plus cars of the funeral cortege drove by, African Americans all along the route placed their hands or their hats over their hearts, paying final respects. Here are the final words of Alex Haley's epilogue to the autobiography of Malcolm X. The night fell over the earthly remains of El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, who had been called Malcolm X, who had been called Malcolm Little, who had been called Detroit Red and Satan and Homeboy and other names, who had been buried as a Muslim. According to the Koran, the New York Times reported, the bodies of the dead remain in their graves into the last day, the day of judgment. On this day of cataclysm, the heavens are rent, and the mountains ground to dust. The graves open, and men are called to account by Allah. The blessed, the God-fearing, the humble, the charitable, those who have suffered and been persecuted for Allah's sake, or fought in religious wars for Islam, are summoned to the Garden of Paradise. There, according to the teaching of Muhammad the Prophet, they live forever by flowing streams, reclining on silken cushions, and enjoying the company of dark-eyed maidens and wives of perfect purity. The damned, the covetous, the evildoer, the follower of gods other than Allah, are sent to eternal fire, where they are fed boiling water and molten brass. The death from which ye flee will truly overtake you, the Koran says. Then will ye be sent back to the knower of things secret and open, and he will tell you the truth of the things that ye did. After signing the contract for this book, Malcolm X looked at me hard. A writer is what I want, not an interpreter. I tried to be a dispassionate chronicler, but he was the most electric personality I have ever met, and I still can't quite conceive him dead. It still feels to me as if he has just gone into some next chapter to be written by historians. <laughs> Oh, my God.